Everyone, please assemble. I'd like to call to order the Capitola City Council regular meeting this July the 25th. And City Clerk, please uh, repeat the um, roll call. Yes, Council Member Story. Here. Council Member Peterson. Here. Council Member Brooks. Here. Council Member Botworth. Here. Mayor Bertrand. Thank you. And let's rise for Pledge of Allegiance. don't mind that brief um, interruption at the start of the meeting take a picture to uh, help second harvest in their food drive this year so I'd like to um, read a brief announcement uh, this meeting is cable cast live on charter communication channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. and also on charter channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed live from the city's website, and our technician tonight is Kingston Rivera. As a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting, and if you'd like to have your name recorded when you come up to speak, please sign the uh, sheet at the podium. Thank you. So at this point, I'd like to ask, is there a report on closed session? Thank you, Mayor Bertrand. City Council met at 8.30 to 4 o'clock this morning on the first item, the public employee appointment. Took a recess from 4.30 to 6 p.m. and then discussed two closed session litigation items. No reportable action was taken. Thank you. Um, any additional materials, City Clerk? Yes, we received six items for item um, 9A, uh, two of which were received today and there are copies at the dais. Mm -hmm. um, we also received uh, one public comment and one um, additional material, which is actually the copy of the pertinent code, which were distributed afterward for item 9D. Um, all of the additional materials are available for the public at the back and uh, recent items are at the dais. Thank you. Any deletions and additions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. Okay. At this point, I'd like to open uh, the, the public. Any comments that like to be made uh, on items not on the agenda? Please come forward. Thank you. I'm Sheree McCoy, Capitola homeowner and resident for 25 years, and I'm here to talk about safety to address traffic issues on 41st Avenue, a study was conducted between 2001 and 2016 by Safe Streets LA. The executive director of Safe Streets and an expert at automated red light enforcement, Jay Bieber, provided the analysis of the findings. He admits that the study is incomplete because it only uh, focuses on rolling right turns. Mm. Data was first collected from 2001-2005 and statistics show there <clears throat> was no collision incidents at the intersection of 41st Avenue and Capitol Main Mall entrance. Yet the red light <clears throat> runner cameras were installed there in October 2005. Because the cameras seemed pointless, I inquired with the city of Capitola as to why these cameras were placed in that location instead of where the traffic problems were up the street at the intersection of 41st and Claire's. The official told me that these lights were being tested and once they were all dialed in, they would move them down to 41st and Claire's. Flash forward 2007, the red light runner cameras were installed at 41st and Claire's. They seemed to move a lot and we wondered what was going on and why are they always focused on Claire's towards Burger King, 41st right? I again communicated my concerns with the city that the red light runner cameras need to be focused where the multitude of daily traffic law violations occur. And uh, just think of how much revenue Capitola can make by enforcing basic traffic laws. The lady on the phone thanked me for my input. 
Over a decade later, I was surprised to receive a phone call from someone saying with the, they're with the Capitola Police Department, and they're following up on my inquiry about Claire's and 41st. Uh, I explained that um, there's a problem, and uh, I told him, uh, he told me that it's all because people come off Highway 1 when South is backed up, and they cut through Claire's as a back way. And I said, there's a multitude of reasons that are going on. And that was about it. I uh, went into a lot of detail of each one. A few months after that strange phone call, uh, there was a woman killed, Cynthia Carey of Mount Hermon, at that very intersection of Claire's and 41st. According to the news reports, she was stationary in the middle of the road when she was hit by a van and slammed into a bus. On a happier note, I'm also talking about the Capitola Mall overhaul. I think it's a great idea, but I think 630 uh, living units with 1,100 new cars uh, in this intersection is a problem. Thank you. If anybody you. would like a copy of my detailed notes, I'd be happy to email them to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments, and you're well prepared. So any other people would like to speak? Seeing none, uh, let's go back to City Council for City Council comments and staff comments. I have nothing. You have an announcement. Right? Yeah, I would. Yeah. I'm sorry. You do? I do. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought you no, I'm sorry. Okay. Kristen, sorry. please. Kristen. And you're going to have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to bring two things um, up tonight. One is that I'd be interested in looking at uh, the possibility of updating our water fountain at the um, by the stand the bandstand over there the Santa Cruz Wharf recently um, put in the water fountain that where you can do re use water use their bottles to refill there so I'd be interested in looking at that and then I currently sit on the children's network board and was asked to appoint an alternate at this point I'd like to go out um, reach out to the community to see if anyone would be interested in sitting in as my alternate on that um, commission thank you okay um, sorry for making way no. <laughs> sorry for skipping over council member Brooks. yes um, I just wanted to announce that tomorrow uh, from 4 30 to 7 30 correct Yes, from 4.30 to 7.30 tomorrow at Monterey Park will be the first Food Truck Friday event. Uh, I've been to some of these events in Scotts Valley and they're lots of fun and I'm excited to see one uh, coming here as for our first time. So I hope to see you all there and I am looking forward uh, to some, some good food and some good times in the park. Sam? No comments. Okay, um, I have no comments. Uh, on to <coughs> boards, com excuse me, city staff. Just one brief bit of clarification on Councilwoman Brooks's uh, request for the water fountain. Mm -hmm. I believe my staff actually, I think great minds think alike, I believe my staff has already been working on that. Would or Are you asking for a council hearing on this or is there something that we could, uh, if we're already making progress, report off agenda? I, I would appreciate that. that yeah, okay. thank, thank you. you. That's great to hear. Yeah. Okay. Um, item 7, Board Commissions and Committee Reports. We have a few uh, appointments, excuse me, historic museum appointment. Um, are we going to have a presentation from the city council? Um, city clerk? Um, just the announcement that um, following recruitment, the museum board interviewed Dean Walker and has recommended that he be appointed to what is a basically a three-year term um, minus one month. Um, so it is recommended that by the board that he join them. Okay. that's a. Appointment action on our part. Is there a motion? Uh, move to approve the appointment to the museum board. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Nope. Seeing that, it carries. And item B, youth appointment. I believe you worked with this young man. I did. Um, <laughs> we have uh, Bryce um, Ibrahimian, who has interested in serving as a youth member on two of our commissions, both the Finance Advisory Committee and the Commission on the um, Environment. Um, these are one-year school year terms, um, um, and he is eligible for both positions. So the recommendation is the um, appointment of him as a youth member. I see Bryce in the audience. Would he like to come forward? <laughs> You do not want to come <laughs> forward. Okay. We had, we had Bryce at our finance advisory committee meeting uh, last week, and it was really exciting to have that that new energy there. And, and as our um, 
finance director had mentioned to him during that meeting was a lot of the things that are being done now are going to be the future that, that his generation controls later. So it's really exciting to have that youth voice there. So I'm excited to, uh, to have you join those boards, Bryce. And I'd like to point out, it was Kristen, one of her first moves was to include um, the reach out to youth members. So thank you very much. And uh, Bryce is a neighbor of mine, and um, thank you for volunteering. Mm -hmm. So this is an actual item. Is there a motion? I'll, oh. I'll make the motion. I just want to um, add that or ask staff to make sure that these new commissioners um, participate in some sort of onboarding process. We have a new... Um, social media ordinance and um, I know that there's a booklet being updated. I just want to make sure that 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 takes place. It's a great comment. Real quick. Hey Bryce, I just want to encourage you to, to uh, get some of your friends to get involved in uh, public service too, okay? Thank you for your service. I did notice our finance director had already taken him on his wing, so I think there's some interaction right there, so that's great. Um, second still? Second. I need a second, yes. Second. Second. Okay. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. It carries. Thank you very much. Let's move on to consent calendar. I understand there's uh, um, something you'd like to say, Sam? Oh, uh, yes, Mayor. Thank you. I just wanted to point out on item uh, 7E on the consent calendar, I have a, a, a conflict and I will um, be recusing myself from that particular item. So you may want to maybe take that as a separate vote. Okay, let's take that as a separate item. Would someone like to make a motion on all items except for E? Motion to adopt consent calendar excluding item E. Second. Yeah, okay. just and maybe as a point of order, if um, you want to, if any members of the public want to remove an item from the consent calendar. Okay, so we have a first and a second. Any items in the public would like to speak on these items on the consent calendar except for item E? Seeing none, back to City Council for a vote. Uh, All those, in, you have a comment. Yeah, Sorry. I have a comment on item uh, 8F, the resolution for approving rec recreation job classifications. Okay. I'd be interested in, um, I, well, I just don't know. I, I would ask that we could include a more specific um, detail on the classification itself on the age group that these folks will be working with. It, uh, so if it would say from, I think it's generally just as middle school, but I think it would be best if we can add ages, I don't even know age what middle, criteria. yeah, or what is that? I don't even know what middle school age is, but. We, can, we could amend the job description to add the age range because it does say activities for middle school youth. So we can certainly add an age range to the job descriptions. Okay, and then the second piece is um, there w the law just passed regarding the minimum wage to $15 an hour, and our after school leader position starts at $14.59. I would ask that we look at beginning that classification at $15 an hour. I don't know what the process would be for doing that at this time. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. So our entire hourly wage structure we review every year in January, and we've been moving it up each year to keep in sync with the minimum wage increases. So that increase, as those increases phase in, those positions would be increased along with the whole hourly wage structure. Those increases have averaged, I believe, about 4 to 5% a year. So that would take place. We wouldn't be paying someone under the minimum wage. Alternatively, you could propose to amend the the uh, schedule as adopted this evening. I would propose that we begin the salary at 15 effective immediately instead I, of waiting. I don't know if that's. I think that that may need to be pulled if we're going to take that. I don't know. I'd be happy to know. We need discussion of it. So this is a separate item. So in terms of uh, Yvette's um, recommendation or question. Would you like me to pull the item? Why don't we pull the item and we can discuss it later this evening? Okay. okay. So, so I'll I make a, do, would you like me to yep. make the motion to approve items A, B, C, D, and G, and, oh, and not F? And we would pull that to discuss at a later time? Do we, we should do it tonight. I think we need to get these job descriptions out so we can get the positions hired, but we can do it later this evening. We already have a motion and second on okay. the floor. Do we need to drop I those? Just, I can just amend it to delete okay. uh, F. 
I mean, so it would be okay. deleting E and F. And you agree uh, and with I'll that? second and that you still. Yes. Second. Okay. okay, so everything except for E and F. There's a motion on the floor. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, so let's go on to item E. Sam, you're recused. You don't need to leave the dais, I believe. Is there a motion on item E? Motion to adopt item E. Second. Okay, is there anyone from the city, uh, uh, those attending right now, uh, would like to comment on item E? Seeing none, bring it back to city council. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Count. It passes. So we'll do item F at the end of the meeting. Right. Okay. Moving on to 9A, report on the jewel box traffic calming project results. And I see Steve at the dais. Good evening, we'll now Mary hear a re report from uh, Director Steve. Item before you is a uh, post project report on the traffic calming it, uh, measures we installed uh, around the jewel box. Uh, a little bit of history here uh, following, uh, I think it's been over two years of hearings and public surveys and workshops. The council approved a set of traffic calming measures for the jewel box neighborhood. Um, based on results we'd gotten at a workshop that was held in June 2010. As the table which summarizes the uh, traffic calming measures that were discussed at the workshop, uh, the items um, highlighted in red there, the speed tables and turn restrictions both received uh, significant participant support at this uh, workshop. The uh, speed tables got 90% support and the turn restrictions received 80%. So. Based on this uh, kind of public input, uh, the council did approve a project. Um, that project scope included the construction of speed tables, two of them on Jade Street and one on 42nd Avenue, and the implementation of turn restrictions during commute hours on Topaz Street and 47th Avenue. The construction of the uh, speed tables and the signs were installed in April of 2019 and we did conduct traffic monitoring before and after the construction. A little bit more on the traffic monitoring. The pre-project monitoring was conducted on a single day, a uh, single 24-hour period on Thursday, March 14th. This was one week before construction began on the speed tables. Uh, the data included speed and volume counts at 21 different locations throughout the greater jewel box area. Uh, the second set of data was collected on May 1st, so it's approximately three weeks following the uh, implementation of the traffic calming measures. Uh, we used the same uh, blocks that we measured on the first time, uh, during the first phase. Um, 21 sites and two days of data, we ended up with quite a bit of 576 pages of data to, to analyze. So we kind of focused our analysis on the most likely impacted routes during the commute hours because that's really what we were targeting with these improvements. So here's a quick map of the area. The red dots on this map, so this is Jade Street, 45th Avenue, 42nd Avenue, Capitol Road, and then this is the formal jewel box neighborhood. Um, the red dots indicate uh, where the traffic monitoring was taken before and after. So like I said, we did our analysis looking at the, uh, the 3 to 6 p.m. traffic, and we also looked at only in the eastbound and northbound directions as those are the primary traffic, um, heavy traffic that we get through the neighborhood at those times. So eastbound on coming in off of uh, Bromer onto Jade, eastbound on Capitol Road, and uh, northbound on uh, 47th Avenue. So looking at the local traffic impacts, it's really um, involved with the turn restrictions that we placed at uh, Topaz, where we restricted entrance onto Topaz, whether it was a left turn going straight off of, Gray, off of um, Jade Street or coming out of the parking lot, um, and diverted that traffic, ended up diverting, as we could have predicted, to uh, the next streets up on the jewel box. So as you can see here uh, in the chart, Topaz Street uh, Pre-project had a volume of 203 cars and post-project volume was 129. So they went down by 74 cars um, in, the, in the monitoring. 
Opal Street, Jewel Street, and Garnet all saw increases. I think it totals 77 or 76. Very close um, in uh, numbers to the amount of traffic that was diverted off of Topaz. Interesting, Emerald actually went down by 19. That's the next street up um, before you get to Crystal, which is one way. Um, you know, that's just a traffic variation. I, I can't explain why they went down, but you know, we're looking at two snapshot periods here. So, but that's the what the data provided. On the regional impacts, um, we I'm looking at the impacts we uh, we encouraged at 47th Avenue, where we provide where we restricted turning onto 47th from Portola Drive. Um, that is a you know people coming going. West to east through the county, we'll, we'll travel on Tor Portola. It is a, um, a lot of cars turn up 47th to get to Soquel and Soquel Drive, Soquel, town of Soquel. Um, the traffic indicates that we had 524 pre-project and 417, so we saw a reduction of 117, 107 cars. Um, where these cars went is a little harder for me to determine. Um, a lot of them probably went up got off earlier and went up 41st Avenue. Other ones may have continued on Portola Drive and gone into the village, but um, because of the volumes, it's hard to tell where they went. Um, quick notice about enforcement. So the police department began enforcing uh, soon after the construction was completed. During the first week, the officers issued warnings rather than citations and then began issuing citations. And as a policy, the traffic officers randomly select days that they do enforcement at various sites throughout the city to avoid any established pattern. So that's the extent of my report. I'd be happy to have to any questions. Um, the recommendations are to accept this report and provide any direction the council may have. I do have copies of the maps that are included if there's any specifics you want to talk about that. Thank you. Okay, any questions of <coughs> Steve Jesper? Yes. Quick question. If you can go back to that first slide when you were showing the pre, uh, the numbers for the pre-impact and post-impact. This one? Yeah. I'm actually, the only thing that's missing there is you didn't do a total, and I just tried to eyeball it, but it looks to me like there's approximately about a 15% reduction if you look at the volume before and the volume after. You did the volume on the next slide, but I was right. just trying to add up the numbers here, and it, it just appears it's about 350 to 300 just from my quick calculations. So you had mentioned that on the other slide, there was a reduction. You just say you didn't know where they went, but it would indicate that there is some kind of reduction here. I'm looking at volume of cars, pre the volume before, the left column and the middle column. Right. It looks like left column's about 350 and this middle column's about 300, which means less cars. So even though you, it looks like it might be impact in other areas, there was some reduction. Okay. I just wanted to, you didn't have a number there, so I couldn't cumulatively total it. So I just want to throw that in there. Uh, Sam. No questions. Okay. Um, so at this point, we're going to open it to comments from the audience. And um, City Clerk, would you talk about the card structure here? Yes. Um, we are using the colored cards. The first group is the green cards, and they have one minute to speak. So anyone with a green card can start working their way up. They will be followed by the yellow cards, which are given a maximum of two minutes to speak. And finally, the orange cards get the full three minutes, and it is entirely your choice. Um, right in front of the little light, there's a box. You can just drop your card in. Okay. Um, everyone with a green card, please come forward and welcome. Good evening, my name is Neil Savage. I'm on Opal Street in the Jewel Box. So first I want to thank the council and Steve and his staff for working over the last year and over the prior years. We've come a long way since the uh, infamous uh, option four. Um, it's nice to see the lower speeds on the west end of Jade and um, it's nice to see the shift of eastbound at the, during the peak hours off of Topaz. It's just a little disappointing that um, the sign that says no turning on, on to 47th, yeah. we only had a 20% reduction. If people followed the sign, we would have had a 100% reduction. So again, thank you for all your work. And thank you, Neil, for you and your wife for participating and uh, getting the neighbors organized. Appreciate that. Um, any other questions? Uh, excuse me, uh, people on uh, green cards. Okay, moving on to yellow cards for two minutes. I see one person coming up. Uh, 
Thank you. It took me two minutes to get here. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, my name is Shelly Thomas, and um, we live at 4870 Opal Street. We have noticed the increase in traffic, but what's scarier to us is the speed of that traffic. And we're right on the corner, well, two houses back from the corner of 49th and, and Opal. Mm -hmm. And depending on how fast the people take the, cur the turn to head towards Capitola Road, it's very, very dangerous, especially with so many people that walk down to the beach because we've got the stairs a block away. And we've seen some near misses as well as trying to back out of your driveway yeah. at the same time that they're speeding through. So I don't know what the options are to look at, but I mean, speed reduction is a huge concern and a safety concern, of course, for any neighborhood. And so I hope you would consider that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any others with yellow cards? Oh, I see someone. No. Oh, you're coming up. Okay. So seeing none on yellow, uh, now we're on orange cards. Three minutes. So um, my name's Alan Cable, and I live in Topaz Street. And I want to reiterate thanks to Steve and the mayor and the council for... Um, for putting these restrictions in place. I think it's made a great improvement to the speed on Jade. Um, and when it's enforced, um, I think it's had quite a good effect on the overall traffic through the jewel box. And, and if we wind ourselves back four years to when we first started this, um, remember the, the reason for doing this was to improve the safety in the jewel box. Um, th but there was a lot of traffic, a lot of high speed traffic on the residential streets. We wanted to get that traffic off the residential streets and onto the arterials and the collectors. So that was the objective. And I think the issue we have right now is simply one of, of enforcement. Um, people are not complying with the, with the restrictions. Uh, I did an informal survey last Thursday. I just sat for an hour just watching the end of Topaz and the end of 47th. Uh, we had um, 90 cars in one hour turn up onto uh, 47 from yeah. Portola. Um, that's not from the other direction. I didn't even realize there was a restriction there. And we had about 40 cars come through Topaz. So we clearly have a, a restriction problem um, or, or a compliance problem with the, with the restrictions. Um, so we have some suggestions for how we might improve this. Uh, first of all is the obvious one, which is let's improve enforcement. I, I know it's not a a fun thing to do for the police to sit at the end of the street there, but if we don't enforce the restrictions, the people will not comply with them. And uh, there's no reason to spend all that money if you're not going to enforce your restrictions. Um, you know, we can, we can come up with some inventive things. We can use some ghost cars maybe, uh, put some old cruisers there um, to maybe uh, allow people to see that there is something going on. So that's number one. Secondly, let's make the signs more visible. Right now, they're nice little square white signs, uh, great reading material, but I think if we added a red, uh, a red no entry sign there with the time restriction underneath, uh, I think it would improve the compliance. I think people would take a look at that and, and be more interested in obeying those restrictions. Um, the third thing we can do, I think, is to consider uh, uh, rolling the restrictions up on the east end of the jewels on, 40, on 45th because, uh, and that's what the last speaker was talking about, because all, a lot of the cars are just coming and popping up one street. So if, if we can roll it up to the rest of the jewels, I think it would make a big difference uh, and, and, and achieve the goal of getting the cars onto the arterials uh, or the collectors. Um, so in summary, I think we've made a really good start. I think we really need to step up the restriction, step up the enforcement and I think if we do that, um, the jewel box will be a, a much safer place. The village will be a safer place to live in. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm a jewel box resident, and I live on Opal Street. And I've been coming to the city council meetings for this issue, and I also went to the community meeting. I think one thing that isn't in the report is at the community meeting we did go through and brainstorm ideas. But one thing that Topaz residents seem to agree with is they didn't want to simply just push this problem off onto other streets. And when reviewing the report, if you look at the numbers, 
Um, to answer your question, there's only an increase, a uh, decrease of 15 cars total if you look at those numbers. I just added up, it's 5%, not yeah. 15. And yeah. so, I mean, that goes to just show the minus 19. We don't know where those cars went or if it was because of the no turn signs. But if you look at the numbers also further in the report, on Oval Street, there just the one block between 45th and 47th, there was a 224% increase, which is the 81. If you look at the further eastern block, which my neighbor was talking about, that's a 96% increase in traffic. And on Garnet, there was an 84% increase in traffic. I've seen enforcement for the no turns. People are still turning down towpaths. So these numbers are showing people still going down the street. What happens through enforcement when people finally realize that they need to stop turning down that street? They start going down the other streets. And we end up in the situation that the Topaz residents said they didn't want to put on their neighbors, which was just simply push this problem off. So what I'm asking is, what are we going to do about the problem as a whole? Let's not think about what are we going to do just today, but let's be forward thinking. No turn signs seem to be a quick fix that's simply bumping it down the street. Then fine, put a no turn on Opal, put a no turn down and down, but then it's just pushing it further down and then there's no access to the neighborhood for anyone. So what I'm asking from the people who are educated in this area, what do we do to fix this problem? I don't know. This isn't my area. We're making steps in the right direction, but a 224% increase, an 84% increase, I don't think those are the fixes for the long term. It seems like it's a fix right now for Topaz, but eventually once people stop going down Topaz, they're gonna to start going down the other streets. And I've seen it myself where people are just driving too fast and I don't know how to fix the problem, but I think we need to think not just about today, but what's going to happen next. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Melinda Vento. I live on Topaz Street. Um, been here before. Want to say first thank you for really all the measures that the city has taken so far to help us. Um, it's very much appreciated. Uh, I actually came to ask, and I know I won't get an answer tonight, but I'd love to understand how many citations were issued as enforcement for this. And the reason I say this is we, uh, we, we've seen a decrease in the traffic on Topaz during the rush hour, but quite frankly, um, I still battle to get in my driveway. There's that many cars coming through when I pull in, um, going the wrong way. <laughs> So um, I would love to understand. I, I do believe that enforcement, um, whatever measures we take, it needs to be enforced or this, all this investment, will, it, it won't do any good, right? So, and people follow other people. Um, the gentleman that just spoke, I would completely agree with. I, I live on Topaz. I would, I would like to not see this traffic push to our neighbor's streets. I don't want to see them have the issues. We have a huge volume, even with the increase on these other streets. The volume is so high on our streets that, unfortunately, um, you know, we, we do need some relief, but um, would love to see whatever solution is implemented long term um, that is enforced. I, I just, I think we need help. Um, and I, I have been told that um, some of the concern is, well, it's the residents that are, live in the jewel box. It's my neighbors that would be getting the tickets. But I would say that most of my neighbors that live in the jewel box actually would love to see the traffic decrease. And most of them, I think, do actually obey the law. So anyway, I want to thank the city council and, and, and everybody that supported all this. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name's Jim Hobbs, and my wife Jan and I uh, live on Topaz Street between 45th and 47th. And uh, we have, we walk our dogs a couple of times a day. We have a couple of old dogs, and so it's nice to, we have definitely noticed a decrease in the amount of traffic um, during, particularly during the evening commute. And we're very appreciative of the council's actions that uh, got that implemented. Um, so that I just want to reaffirm what everyone is saying is that we are very appreciative of that. Um, that being said, the only thing that I've heard from other people is they 
say, well, I didn't really see the sign down there, which is a little mystifying to me because it's not really a small sign, it's a large sign. But as Alan said, some people have uh, not they aren't very observant, I suppose, and so maybe a little color around it or something would make it more visible so people would uh, pay more attention to it. And of course, um, enforcement is the key to the whole thing of, of uh, people complying with it anyway. So I just wanted to put that in. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Linda Smith. I live on the other end of the Joel Box, and I'm not going to take three minutes, but I didn't want to be repeating a bunch since I am far away from the problem. Um, the last time I spoke on this subject, we were looking at pop potentially barricading off the Joel Box. And because there are so many of us that live on the other side of 49th Avenue, the barricades would have cut us off from, from accessing 41st or put us on to cliff and then back up the hill or Capitola Road, which is already extremely congested. I think what you've done is a good step in the right direction. I'm one of the people I was out of town when the signs all got implemented. And when I came back, I couldn't remember where they had been put. So I went looking for them. The white sign is sort of hard to see. Um, the enforcement that we did, I've heard that enough people got tickets that it got people's attention. And I know a lot of my neighbors that live over on Prospect Avenue and on that other side of the jewel box, we don't drive down Topaz anymore because of our awareness of the issue. Um, I personally pick different streets to drive down, but when I'm going to Jaden 41st, which right now my husband's having um, physical therapy there, barricading off would make it really difficult for us to do our normal you know, routine stuff. So the speed tables are excellent. Um, I think they're a lot better than the speed bumps because it's been my observation that people actually do slow down and they don't just hop over them. Um, and the red sign idea, I think, is a great idea. Thank you, Linda. Hi, my name is Cherry McDonald. We live on the corner of Jewel and 47th. I want to tell you we've lived there for over 22 years and we've seen a marked increase in traffic. And it's even with the study, um, there's been hours where it didn't change at all. We've done informal studies and a friend who lives on Opal has done informal studies and we've found that there's been very little change, especially on the weekends. Even though the signs are basically for what I would call rush hour traffic, the weekend traffic coming up out of the village, turning on 47th and roaring through most of them, I want to say, are at the end of a day of partying, and they're screeching their tires, and the motorcycles are so loud, and it's just, it's impossible. I need some of you to come and spend an evening on our deck listening to the traffic from 5 to 9, and you'll have an idea of what we put up with. We honestly can't even listen to the television with the doors open. We have to lock the house up on that side where the street is in order to enjoy an evening at home. And that's really pathetic. It's not the number of cars as much as the attitude of the drivers. Yeah. So I want to thank you for what you're doing. And I really appreciate Steve and all of the people. We've attended all these meetings. We've been in all of the you know, studies and things. I just don't think we're addressing it boldly enough. We need to do more. So maybe they enforce it during the week, not on weekends. I don't know. But if you live on 47th, that's a very narrow street, 40 feet wide, and people are going over 60 miles an hour sometimes. You can take my grandson's little laser gun that they use for baseball, and you can check how fast the cars are going, and it's appalling. It's a 25 mile an hour zone according to the signs. And it's, that's not at all what happens. In fact, we put locks on the gates, and we don't let our grandkids out the doors. They have to stay on the deck to play not even ride their scooters or anything, unless we take them down someplace to ride them. So I think we need to reconsider what we're doing. What we're doing is the, a step in the right direction, and it is appreciated, but I don't want to leave the misconception that we're finished. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dave Aaron. I live at uh, 4980 Garnet Street and wanted to uh, thank the council and the department for their 
sort of thoughtful uh, solutions to uh, sort of a joint set of problems that we in the neighborhood have. I just wanted to make a couple observations and, and one sort of request, the, fr the first of which is the captured data before and after shows everywhere in the jewel box except on the east side of 49th. Um, you know, we too are in the neighborhood and would like to see if these changes affected us positively or negatively. I know that every time that we want to go uh, to our homes from uh, sort of, um, well, uh, every time we try to get to our homes from uh, 40, 40, 47, 47. Yeah, there's a no left turn sign, so we get to drive through the village, which between <laughs> three and six is not always enjoyable. So we feel like we're being affected by the decisions are made um, without any benefit ourselves, or at least understanding what those benefits might be. Uh, secondly, I was a little confused as to the uh, the way the signage got implemented. Originally, said uh, that there was no left turn at a number of places, but no Monday through Friday designation. Um, there's a no left turn sign eastbound cliff that was approved by the city council. Now there's a sign that also prevents uh, westbound turns on cliff down to 47th. That's a street that we take regularly, and again, we sort of end up in the in the stew down there in the village, and we didn't quite understand why that second sign got put in. You know, my, my proposal or my idea was that sort of the uh, no left turn on eastbound 47th onto 47th makes sense because that's where many sort of interlopers are going as they're trying to cut through and get to the village the fastest. But people who live in the neighborhood um, would have benefit by knowing they could go down Opal Cliffs, turn left onto uh, on the cliff and then right onto 47th to get to their homes. So it wouldn't necessarily be sort of the interloper type who's just coming trying to get to the village fast. People who actually live in the neighborhood would get the benefit of a second route in that might not be as well known to people, yet it would provide easier access to the people who actually live in the neighborhood. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Ron. My name is Ron Burke. I've been working on this issue for about 20 years. <laughs> Since establishing this pay times back with the Committee of Seven back in 1999, uh, definitely the traffic has gotten worse. And it's not just the counts, it's the behavior of the drivers being the fact that Jill Box neighborhood is used as a cut through. In fact, my wife and I were at dinner last Friday night, and we had a couple right behind us. And they, where are you from? We're Jewel Box. Oh, we drive through there all the time. <laughs> and that's typically what we encounter. In fact, even my sister-in-law said that just a few days ago. She said, oh, we just wanted to pass through. It's very typical. It is a problem. It's getting worse. I want to definitely thank Steve and thank you who are involved for what you've done. You've taken some strides to get us in the right direction. It's very much appreciated. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to say as far as the actual improvements. The speed tables on Jade Street, they've been wonderfully effective, I believe, talking to the neighbors in Tradewinds Mobile Home Park. It used to be in the old days, about 20 years ago, that there were um, uh, there was a crosswalk there so people can get across and eventually make it all the way over to, uh, I think it was, it was Albertsons or Ralph's, if you remember, right? this Whole Foods now. And that gets in that direction safely. Those of you have been around long enough, you remember these things. Um, so that's been very helpful. One of the things about the speed tables is unlike the humps, you, it forces you to slow down. Some drivers and drive over the humps we've experienced for the last X years, 47th, 45th, 49th. If you go to a certain speed and you know, have enough ground clearance, you can just go over those humps really fast. There are outliers, we have a few, but that creates the biggest danger, pulling out of your driveway in a narrow street, what have you. So one recommendation I would make for 47th, 45th, 49th, the center speed hump of the three between Topaz, and Capitola Road, replace the hump with a table. That's number one. Mm. Um, it's a moderate cost. I know they cost a lot more than they did when we had these put in 20 years ago, but it's a consideration. The, re the reason why is, be is because Portola to Capitola Road on 47th is a little over a quarter mile. It is a drag strip. In the old days, if you've been around long enough, you probably remember even with the stop signs at Topaz, people used to fly right through there and they would gun it. They don't do it as often, but they still do. That will help stop the speed in the middle, basically. Um, and the one thing I've mentioned before, I definitely want to um, ring with is the fact that um, enforcement is a big deal. Speed tables, speed humps, what have you, they're self-enforcing. They're always there. They don't go away. Stop signs or no left turn signs, no right turn signs are there for a good reason. 
but they're willing, they're, people have to willing to make a decision, will I violate the law or not? We're finding a lot of people just run right through. I could show you pictures on my phone recently of cars coming through in a line, eight, 10 cars in a row at four or 5 p.m. weekdays. They just don't care. What is really funny kind of is I have an office that's over 47th and I see them that go by. People are looking back and forth. Sometimes they're close together. The psychology I figure is if one person goes, you could get caught. If eight, 10 people go, it's only one is gonna get caught. Let's all go together. It's kind of a funny philosophy, but this is the way it works. Um, so that was another suggestion. There's something else I was thinking about that offhand I forgot. But um, yeah, it's been very effective uh, as a near-term solution. So thank you for your consideration. We hope for the best. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joanne Kissling. I live just outside the jewel box. And since there's, I wasn't even gonna speak tonight, but there's so many people from within the jewel box and I, and I, this whole issue has actually made me more aware of the issue and I've tried to be more considerate. Um, I did used to use Topaz all the time to get home because it's my obvious route, but I have changed my patterns. I would like to say that while, you know, it's put me at some inconvenience, I'm okay with the changes that, that have been implemented and I'm trying to be sympathetic to the suffering of the jewel box people, but we live in a beach town and this is, you know, we all live on streets. We, even outside the jewel box, it's hard to get out of your driveway. There's drunk people going by at night. You know, I had to keep my kids inside of fences their whole lives growing up. It, I don't think it impaired them at all. They're great kids. So I guess my point is just that what I didn't see in the data is the impact to around the jewel box because I've noticed a lot more traffic on my street. I've noticed a lot more traffic going down Portola into the village. And in that ha I don't like that from an environmental standpoint, let alone the fact that it's inconvenienced other people. So, you know, we keep saying, I keep hearing that, you know, we've got to fix the jewel box, but it's like, you're just going to, you're going to move the problem down the road. So I think load balancing from within these streets, and this is a fairly limited data set as well, but load balancing within the streets, I agree with Linda, is a good answer. And, you know, we all have to kind of, I, I feel like, you know, my street's definitely taken up a lot of the slack. And, you know, but to go further and just say, we live on a certain type of street and other people live on a different type of street and they have to take the problem, that I don't like that. So I just wanted to give a little bit of a countervailing point of view. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joanne. With that, are there any others that would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, bring it back to City Council for comments and direction. And uh, by the way, thank you for everyone who participated and came up to speak. We appreciate your comments. Where do you want to start? Oh, I think that uh, Sam or Kristen? Start down. I'm, I'm happy to start. Sam? Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for coming out um, and um, you know, given us your perspective, your experiences about uh, the changes that were made by the council there. And I think it's important to follow up on the things that we do and to really uh, try to evaluate them. I know this is not a perfect data set, but it is a reasonable attempt to see the impacts of uh, the measures that we implemented. Um, now, with, and with that said, I, my overall view is that this has been, um, certainly uh, effective on reducing the amount of traffic on Topaz, and I think that's a good thing. I think that as much awareness as we can create among one another about our driving habits and how they may impact uh, the neighborhoods and the residents will, to some extent, help alleviate this problem. Um, and so, uh, I want to, I view this as uh, a place where we've started, but we need to keep uh, working at it. We need to keep and um, uh, the discussions with the residents and try to implement other corrective measures. I'm concerned about how we've shifted some of this to Opal um, and are there things that we can do to help alleviate um, that um, uh, impact that we've created there. Um, 
I did want to also want to address um, the one question that came up about uh, the overall, how do you globally resolve this issue? Um, and unfortunately, uh, Capitola and the City Council here does not have uh, the authority and power to, uh, to globally uh, resolve this issue. We can't block off the streets. We can't build a wall around the city. Um, and that is under the purview of the Regional Transportation Commission. I think we all know the reason that people cut through Capitola because Highway 1 is blocked up. That's the global solution. And that's what um, we need to continue to work with our regional transportation electeds um, and have them focused upon <laughs> Highway 1. And I think that that would do a great deal uh, toward alleviating some of the issues that we experience. Um, uh, I do specifically about some corrective measures, the recommendations. I agree um, that um, the signage needs to be uh, better done. Um, more impactful, more visible, um, and then after that's done, or even not even waiting for that, but of course enforcement. Um, I think that we should um, have our police department focus on uh, uh, enforcement so that people become, let's say, trained about um, what the consequences of their actions are going to be, um, and I think that people will stop, will tend to uh, stop doing that. Yet, yeah, because I am a little disappointed about how the numbers on 47th really didn't go down as much as we had hoped. Um, and I think that ultimately at this point, that is going to take better enforcement. And I also heard, um, and I think those are good suggestions about um, uh, maybe replicating some of those turn restrictions. Um, but I would want to be cautious and make sure that we're communicating with all the neighbors there because it does have an impact on you. If we put up turn restrictions, then you're going to have to be driving around just to get home. Um, so we should keep those in mind, but we should do that in good uh, communication uh, with um, the residents uh, about other measures that we, we may be able to uh, implement. Um, and. And then, um, you know, and, and, and overall, I mean, because Jewel Box is not the only neighborhood uh, in Capitola, um, and I think the council needs to be mindful of people who live on Capitola Road, who live on 45th Avenue, who live on Wharf Road, um, and doing what we can to try to um, mitigate some of the impacts um, when we uh, do some of these restrictions, because it just, Sometimes it's just going to push the problem someplace else. Um, so I think those are my thoughts. Um, let's, let's do better signage. Let's follow up with good enforcement. And let's continue the dialogue about what are some other measures that the residents there think would be appropriate to um, uh, alleviate uh, the increased traffic. And particularly, I do want to focus upon on Opal Street um, and seeing what we can do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming out this evening and for everyone who's participated for years in addressing this issue and looking for solutions. Um, I am glad to see that overall there is a decrease in cars in the jewel box um, and that there's a decrease in cars on Topaz. Um, it is disheartening to see the increase on Opal Street. Um, I remember when we discussed this previously, we had this conversation um, about we didn't want to move all the traffic onto another street. Uh, we also had the conversation about how there would not be a way to do this for any street without it somehow being divided up amongst the other streets. So I think it was to be to ex expected to a certain degree, um, but it is disheartening to see nonetheless. Um, as Sam said, and I, I will echo, unfortunately, there's just, there is no way to equalize cars on, on every street to make sure there's the same number of cars or to ensure that cars aren't coming into the jewel box. Um, I think there's a lot we can do, as already mentioned, through enforcement, um, potentially taking a, a bigger look at the signs. I know that um, we had a budget for this whole project of um, 80,000, $80, and we've expended 72 of it already, so we are limited at this point at, at what more we can do, at least at this time in this, this fiscal year. Um, the, the comments about 
the attitudes of the drivers, I 100% sympathize with. Um, in recent years, Capitola has become more and more popular as a tourist destination because we live in a beautiful place and people want to be here. And we can't blame them for that because we all live here because it's a beautiful place. Um, but I live on Cherry Street right behind uh, Capitola Avenue here in the village. And I have also seen people going 60 miles an hour down what is essentially a one lane street. It's a two way, but it's a one lane street going 60 miles an hour, screaming at each other. When I work at the, in the shop in the village, I hear people screaming at each other for parking. I've seen people screaming at our police officers for receiving police uh, citations, and it's incredibly disheartening, it's incredibly frustrating, and quite honest, it's appalling behavior, not only as a neighbor or a visitor, but just as a decent human being. And so I sympathize, and I, I hear you, and I wish that there was something we could do um, about that, but I'm not sure that there's anything we can do to change the attitudes of individuals. Um, but if there was, I'd, I'd be happy to look at that because it certainly is, it is frustrating. Um, overall, I, I think that the staff report, you know, asks for us to consider, um, you know, giving direction. Uh, taking no further action, declaring the project complete, modifying existing tra traffic control devices, or three other actions. Um, I think from what we've heard, the existing traffic control devices are effective, uh, with the exception perhaps of a sign needing to be bigger or more visible. Um, and so I would uh, definitely support maintaining the modifications we've already created um, and just continuing a conversation overall, continuing um, contact with your council members, contact between council members and staff, um, between council members and or staff and, and the community. Um, because as I mentioned, our budget is low on this. We have seen some effectiveness, but again, this, that doesn't mean that this is the end all be all of traffic solutions in the jewel box or anywhere. Um, so for now, and, and, and of course there may be other uh, changes or modifications as the comments continue, but for now I would like to make a motion that we um, maintain the existing traffic control devices, um, and that's all I'll put on my motion right now, that we maintain the existing traffic control devices. A friendly amendment to that? Mm -hmm. And, and possibly come back and do some numbers a year from now and, and, uh, and evaluate how, how we're progressing? That sounds great, yes. I'll, I'll second that. Okay, there's uh, a motion and a second. Uh, and, and I just had a follow-up question when staff is ready. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, my question is, has, so has Waze or MapQuest companies been updated regarding these new limitations? Is there a way? So we have t we have emailed with Google Maps, who runs Waze and, okay. and the Google Map app. Um, I believe their response was, thank you for the information. Um, <laughs> you didn't get they're hold they're of rather there. difficult and, and, and non-communicative. So we have reached out to them. I can't tell you um, how effective it's been. I checked once or twice and I didn't get routed through there. Mm -hmm. But um, I, they haven't confirmed that they have implemented those changes on the on the And program. MapQuest, is that a different forum? Is that through... I still use MapQuest. Yeah. I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> you do not read out to MapQuest. We can do that. Oh. We, I, okay. All we right. Focus Everyone relax. was appalled. But <laughs> <laughs> we focused on Google and, uh, and Waze. I'm fully embarrassed now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I would just add, I appreciate everyone coming out tonight. I understand that there was a lot of work that was done um, before I arrived up here. Um, and so I agree that there needs to just be a more regular enforcement. I, too, have thought about whether I should go down the street when it said not. Uh, and, um, and agree that there should be better signage because I was surprised when I came across it myself. Um, and and I, yeah, that that's all I had. And well, and that again, I, I would just echo what what councilman story, council member story was saying is that there this is a regional issue, and it is really hard to alleviate traffic not just in one area, but I too live in a heavily impacted area. Um, so that if this were to come forward in another neighborhood that we be neutral and thoughtful um, and just as strategic as we were in this particular process with with other neighbors um, in our in our community great I, I don't have much left I think council member story and Peterson covered all the highlights of what's been done 
I think I want to acknowledge the fact that the speed tables are working. They're, they're slowing people down and they are a deterrent of some sort. Um, I think we tried to convey to everybody that there was no miracle solution and there's really not a le lot left in our bag of tricks here. I, I'm not sure about the color of the signs. I don't know if we're restricted. I know there has something to do with stop signs and yellow and red and Steve shaking his head. So the sign's white and that's it for a reason. Um, I, I have seen in, in some cities uh, that, that are trying something new with a no right turn on red signs. It's a illuminated light that will uh, flash, you know, and light up at certain times. And it could be on a timer where it lights up from three to six. So there might be an improved sign that's available that might be a light. Um, I know that the lights that we have in front of the police station, that was a stop sign that we had significant uh, Hollywood stops or blow throughs. And by adding the red uh, flashing lights around it, I think I, I want to believe that it's reduced it somewhat. I have a stop sign in front of the house where I live, and I would say that uh, one out of 10 cars may stop at that stop sign. So it's an attitude. It's, it's, a, it's a convenience. It's a comfortableness that we all become uh, familiar with in our neighborhoods where we just, you know, blow through signs. Um, I'm not really advocating, you know, I, the enforcement is a tough issue because when I put a police officer there writing the ticket uh, or trying to stop traffic, it, I, I feel like I'm taking away from something that might be a bigger priority. I know that we have the availability of ghost cars and maybe we could use something like that to have a car with nobody in it. And I, I've sat in that conga line uh, on Portola trying to get back into town and it, it's pretty much people obey it until one person breaks the, 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 the sign and goes and then all of a sudden everybody believes, well, if he can go, I can go. So, I mean, it, this is more about human nature, attitudes, things like that. And everybody's shaking their head because we know it. But I think it's what was said here, you know, that's why I, I put the uh, agreed with the motion is, is that I think we've done some good. I think that you're, so you yourself should be commended as neighbors for realizing the burden and, and uh, trying to use different streets. It was nobody's intention to move traffic from one street to another. It's kind of a byproduct. So I think we just need to keep this on the radar. That's why we, I added the inclusion to uh, monitor this a year from now, do some numbers. I'm encouraged by the fact that there's in, any, even a little bit of reduction because what we need to do is frustrate people to the point that they look for another way to go. So uh, that's my comments. So I have a few comments. First of all, I really appreciate, uh, like I said earlier, people coming out and participating in this. Someone said it's been a number of years, so it's quite a, a bit of time to work on something with uh, city staff. And uh, we're definitely, um, city council are supportive of your involvement. Um, also like the comments where some people say they've actually changed their habits in terms of driving in and out of the jewel box and uh, even someone from outside the area said that and they also appreciate the fact that um, this is a global problem as um, Sam mentioned. Now I have a question for the police chief if you would come forward. And then I have a, another uh, question for you Steve after the police chief gives us a little testimony here. Um, just while he's coming forward, uh, traffic has gotten so bad on my street that when I back out of the driveway, I get honks. And it, it's like, you know, I, I think that you'll probably have the same experience. You know, it's like you can't even back out of your driveway now. And uh, like you feel you're taking your life in your hands and you know, I can't see 360 degrees behind me. So my question is, um, Chief, and I know your guys are spread all around the city, just like Ed mentioned. Have you seen any decrease, um, you know, the, the, you know, coming by in random times, uh, any decrease in citations, or is it p still pretty constant? I'm trying to get an idea of your re the response. Sure, and thank you for the question, uh, Mayor Bertrand, council members. Um, the numbers that uh, Steve put together are pretty reflective of that. And, and I'm glad we're talking about driving behavior because that's what we need to change. Right. Driving behavior, regardless of the signage, has not changed to the extent that we would like it to as a police department or, or a community uh, in city. But to answer your question, uh, as an example, the month of April, we had 45 cit written citations for a violation of, technically it's a violation of signs. That's the vehicle code okay. section. We had a, um, a good number of traffic stops that resulted in a warning. Uh, as I've spoken about in the past uh, at council and other meetings, I like to allow my officers to have the discretion to decide if, if a, a, a ticket is the, the best means of changing this driver's behavior or if a warning is appropriate. And so we're doing both of them. Um, just as a comment, and it's been uh, mentioned by the speakers and by council in discussion this evening, 
Uh, enforcement is one piece of the puzzle here. Enforcement alone is not going to change the driving behavior. Uh, people are willing to run the risk of being stopped by a police officer and receiving a citation if they can get home 10 minutes before the car in front of them. And that's what we're dealing with. And so uh, the conversation about signage is an opportunity. Uh, we will continue to do enforcement to, as we uh, are able to, given the competing priorities in the city. Uh, and we'll continue to try and change driving behavior. I think we have an opportunity for a little bit more outreach. Uh, and, and I would like to ask the public to do some of that outreach on our behalf. I don't want to put ourselves and myself or my officers in a position where we're making threats that we're going to uh, have a zero tolerance policy here in the city. I'm not in favor of that as a police chief. Uh, but the outreach, I think, would have a positive effect to try and continually reduce these numbers. And I hope that answers your question. It does. And I hope that uh, your enforcement and activities help. And also, I really appreciate you asking the public to be part of that outreach. Because, in fact, when the public starts talking about something, I think it has a fairly effective. I agree. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Steve. So I know we're doing um, a lot of road work in the jewel box right now. Yeah, you know, a lot of digging. I mean, a lot of people know this. The County of Santa Cruz is doing yes, a lot of road work. Right. right. Um, it's the collective we in this case. Now, you, you told me something very interesting. Steve, I, I really think it was a great idea of yours to let all this work happen and then actually do some surfacing of the roads afterwards. Is that correct? So yeah, the county will be slurry sealing the roads they're working on, and we're trying to work with them to do make sure all the streets in the drill box get slurry sealed at the end of the sewer project, which will be next year, just so people know it's not going to happen this year. It won't happen this year. So I'm glad that you're coordinating with the uh, county on this. I, I think that's great foresight. So um, uh, the mayor of Jewel Box, excuse me, Ron Burke, said that maybe another uh, speed table might work. Or So as we do this review that Ed changed the motion on and it was accepted, so maybe we could take advantage of some of the suggestions and as we get a better idea of how traffic has changed, we could dovetail that into your project because I know you don't want to be having people launch just for one or two Z things. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, as we come through and, and re do another analysis, we can include that and look at the data again and okay. try and see what we can add. Great. Thank you very much. So I think what Steve is letting us know, and uh, Ed's motion sort of recognizes that, it takes a while for us to figure out what the actual effect of any kind of change is. The public slowly changes their habits. Um, the people who live in the jewel box change their habits much faster, but the ones that come through here that are actually the cause of the problem, it takes them a while to change their habits. So in a year time, we'll be coming back to this. In a year time, this dovetails with Steve's uh, foresight and trying to work with the county and doing a slurry seal that maybe we could have some extra um, additions to uh, like speed tables or something like that to help even improve the effect of our actions. So that's the end of my comments. Um, we have a motion, we have a second. Sam, you have some more comments? Yeah, before we have the vote, I wanted to ask for clarification on the motion. Um, it, the motion was to maintain the current, current restriction. I assume that's at the exclusion of any other uh, considerations, changes, additional signage, uh, additional enforcement, or additional um, outreach. Is that, no. do I understand that correctly? Uh, in one sense you do, but I heard the chief coming up that this is an ongoing thing in terms of enforcement. And he also mentioned that he was appealing to the public to neighbors, talking to neighbors and such like that. And I think that's going to be uh, continuing and it will take a while for its full impact to be felt. So uh, I'm still a little unclear about the intent of the motion. Um, uh, I didn't hear emphasized enforcement. I didn't hear. What I understand is that it's going to be status quo for another year, and then we're going to evaluate it again. Would Kristen like to address maybe increased enforcement or continuing sure. enforcement? Yeah. Um, as for outreach, I think that that is something that the chief did address, and I also ask that the, the community continue to be in touch with us and with staff and, and if necessary, with our, our police as well. Um, so that kind of outreach, I think, should continue. Um, as for enforcement, I, I did hear the chief say that that's ongoing. I'm not sure if that's um, something we can discuss. I mean, the, the agenda staff report did indicate that there was uh, warnings for a while and citations for a while. Um, can we get an indication, is there still patrol in that area? Is there still enforcement? Or was that kind of just at the beginning to make sure it was happening and now we're kind of back to 
um, business as usual. Thank you for the question. Additional questions, Mayor Bertrand, council members. Uh, to answer the question about ongoing, is there still ongoing enforcement? Yes, there is. Uh, every day in this neighborhood and many neighborhoods throughout the, the city as there needs to be. Um, I want to guard against a, a motion or discussion related to a potential um, uh, amendment to this motion that might a motion that might suggest to the public that we have some form of a quota that is expected a, as a means of managing this problem because that wouldn't be proper. Um, one of the things that is discussed, uh, ghost cars, and I've spoken uh, on this topic more than a few times over the last couple of years, they have a an effect, sometimes a positive effect. Uh, they don't have the significant effect of deterring uh, uh, traffic violations that most might assume that they do. Uh, you might be surprised to learn that uh, this afternoon in preparation for this meeting, we put a ghost car out there at 47th and Portola, visible to everybody in a one hour period um, right around 80 plus vehicles made that violation anyway. And so that's an indication of the effect of ghost cars. Um, issuing traffic citations, high visibility patrol, high visibility traffic stops when it's appropriate and the necessary enforcement by way of a citation or a warning will continue to have uh, a positive effect in reducing the numbers. But I wanna make it clear, enforcement alone is not going to fix this problem just not going to do it. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess my motion is uh, continues to maintain the traffic um, measures that we are, I don't remember what my phrasing was, the traffic calming measures that are already in place um, to follow up in a year. I guess if, it, if you would prefer, Sam, I could say to encourage our officers to continue enforcement. Um, because I, I think that from discussion and from what we've heard that there's not really much more enforcement that could be done um, unless you have a, a suggested amendment to the motion. No, I, I, I don't think it's necessary to um, tell our chief and our officers because they are going to do their job yes. to the best of their abilities. Um, and enforcement is only one of the three components. I'm more focused to looking at engineering and education, and it seems like that there's maybe a little bit more we could do now uh, to um, uh, improve the situation for, uh, and again, I want to focus on the people who live on Opal. Um, and, um, um, and it seems like that we could do that. Um, signage is not an expensive item. Um, and um, drawing people's attention to it. Um, it would maybe improve the enforcement uh, efforts that we're currently doing. Um, and, uh, but I also think that, um, as the chief mentioned about outreach, that's the education component. There may be um, things that we could do on our scrolls and our newsletters to draw attention uh, so that more people are bec will become aware. Um, we may find that a lot of people who are driving through your through the jewel box are uh, Capitola residents. Uh, I imagine the vast majority may be, and if they become aware, they may um, you know rethink that. I know I have. Um, so that's all I'm I'm suggesting. Maybe doing a little bit more proactive instead of just you know saying oh we did what we did. Let's sit back um, and just study it again in a year. That's a long time. All the, a lot of these folks, you know, they have to live with that situation, and it gets to be, I, I think, a little bit um, um, I, it's more difficult if you live in that environment um, instead of us, and maybe just on the outside looking in. So I think that that's what I, I mean, what I would like to propose, um, and if it's accepted as a friendly amendment, but I think as the way the motion is stated. Um, I don't think I can support it. I would like to maybe see a little bit more uh, effort for the city to make. Uh, and I don't think that they need to be um, expensive or, um, or a very, um, you know, uh, hard uh, enforcement efforts to uh, s solve this issue. And so that, that's my position. Thank you. Ed. I, I think part of what Kristen's uh, uh, motion said, as, as I heard it, was she asked about the budget, and there is $8,000 remaining in the budget, and I think we made some suggestions to the Public Works Director about increased signage. So 
I see that as part of this, and I think for the public made comments about the science could be more visible. So I, I'm, I'm seeing that as something that was included in this motion that we're at least going to look into that and see if there is, you know, a better mousetrap that can work out there. Um, I'm, I'm still, as the chief said, I'm reluctant to give direction or make specific recommendations regarding enforcement. I think that um, I have complete confidence in the police department and what they, where they choose to post tra traffic regulations restrictions. So I'm still comfortable with the motion as, as uh, I was allowed to, a friendly amendment. So that's, that's where I'm, my position. Can, yeah, can I just seek some clarity? Can I have a read back of what the motion is, please? It is maintain the current uh, traffic calming efforts and return to study the traffic in one year. And just to be clear, do we need to state that within this year, within this budget, we will do something about the signs if, it there, if there's enough money to do so? And um, what one of the folks who presented regarding an additional center street bump Speed wrong. table. I, speed yeah. table. You know, if in the budget, if the budget allows, could we, you know, so those are the two things that I just want to make sure that we touch on in addition to what Councilman Story is saying is that we need to do continuous community outreach on this. I don't know what that means necessarily, but that something needs to be done. So maybe we can get some feedback from staff on what that could potentially look like as well as is it necessary to include in our motion those those things I mentioned. Okay, first Kristen and, and Steve, I think you have a comment. If it, if it would um, kind of clear things up here, I would be willing to amend my motion to say maintain the current traffic measures, follow up in one year, and direct staff to include notice of these changes in the jewel box in our next Capitola occurrence newsletter and to direct staff to look at the potential for a bigger sign and changing that one speed bump to a speed hump just to provide that information to us, but not necessarily to take any action on it until approved by council. Would that, would that, does that work? I like it. Yeah, does that work? Ed, would you still second Can, that? Absolutely. All okay. right. Can I comment on just the, on the sign issue? Um, there are state standards um, that allow enforcement to occur. So we have to make sure that we stay within those state standards. Okay. Um, otherwise, it's a make a challenge a ticket and not properly yep. signed. I so mean, I will bigger, work with the police department and, and make sure if the new signage goes in. There's something to look into. If right. there's yeah. no answer, yeah. then right. we at least explored it. Okay. Clearly don't Thank bring you. us options we can't use. <laughs> so, um, I just to be clear, are we asking for council to approve the signs or are you asking for us to evaluate opportunities to clarify them and implement? I think um, Vice Mayor Peterson adjusted her motion the way I yeah to ask you to, to get information on it and bring it back to us okay. um, and then you know I imagine at that point we'll have to look at the budget and decide if we're going to consider it in after the year or if we have the money to do it then but for for tonight the action is to maintain the measures follow up in one year put the changes in our capital occurrence newsletter and direct staff to look into the options for the signs and the speed bump to speed hump alteration for information purposes. Okay, and that's been motioned and seconded by Ed. And are there any more comments on uh, City Council? Okay, seeing none, um, call for a roll call vote on this, please. Councilmember Story? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Bottorf? Aye. Mayor Bach? Aye. Okay, moving on to item B. Resolution for the levy of Capitol Village and Wharf Business Improvement Area Assessments for Fiscal Year 2019 and 2020. Thank you for everyone coming. I really appreciate your response. Thank you. Um, yes, I'll, I'll wait till the mayor of Jewel Box leaves. And, uh, <laughs> um, mayor, if I may, yes. um, while this transition is happening, I, I want to announce that uh, I have a conflict on this item. Uh, I am a member of the BIA. Okay. Um, and it does impact my personal finances, and so uh, that does uh, create a situation where I should recuse myself. So I will step out for this item. Okay. Thank you. Uh, note, uh, City Clerk, that Sam Story is recusing himself. And um, Karn, you've been waiting a long time, so this is, I think, something you're going to speak to. Good. Okay. Okay, you're here. Okay, I'd like to request a, a report from Director Malberg our city finance director. 
Thank you, Mayor Bertrand and City Council. So as you mentioned, this is the Capitola Village and Wharf Business Improvement Area, or BIA, assessments for fiscal year 1920. Um, by way of background, in uh, 2005, the City Council adopted an ordinance that established the BIA. And the BIA is a business-based, self-imposed assessment district, meaning that they impose the assessments upon themselves and the the revenue received from those assessments is then used for improvements and activities that support those businesses. Assessment amounts are determined by the business classification and number of full-time equivalent employees at each location, and each business may make in-lieu payments in the form of gift certificates that the BIA can use in promotional activities, and the amount of in-lieu payments are fixed per business category, per business in each category. Um, as far as this process, on June 13th, the council set a public hearing originally for June 27th. There was an error in the public notice that went out for that, so we continued that public hearing till, to this evening. This evening's public hearing, the notice was published in the Sentinel and delivered to affected business owners. Um, the state law, as well as our muni code, require that the council conduct a public hearing each year prior to approving the assessments, and those assessments are derived from the um, the annual plan and the budget that's submitted by the BIA. And as a reminder, there's no fiscal impact to the city. The work that city staff does for the BIA is reimbursed, and I have those amounts up there, 3,000 for public works and 4,200 for uh, finance. Um, this year, the BIA, as always, includes assessment revenues, but this year it also includes restricted uh, TOT revenues, or transit occupancy tax, as a result of Measure J that was approved by voters in 2018. Um, in February of this year, the council directed that the TOT revenues restricted for local businesses would be split evenly between the BIA and the Capitola SoCal Chamber of Commerce. So you will see in this year's BIA budget a um, 29,000 of restricted TOT revenue, which is the first time we'll, that will show up. Um, a couple of change or a change to the um, assessments for this year proposed by the BIA is to convert the two food service categories on the left, restaurant, bar, and takeout, and restaurant limited into the four categories on the right, which are restaurant with a full bar, restaurant that serves beer and wine, restaurants with no alcohol, and wine tasting and sales. The reason for these changes is this better reflects the businesses that are currently operating in the BIA as opposed to what was there 14 years ago. The impact of those changes would reduce the assessments to these four businesses up there in total by 300. I would like to point out that um, what I'm showing up there for the Capitola Wine Bar and Merchants is what was assessed. They've negotiated last year, I believe the last two years, they've negotiated that assessment down to the restaurant limited category. So we had received um, additional materials at the previous public hearing, the original public hearing that was scheduled from the owners of the Capitola Wine Bar expressing their opposition to an increased assessment. So I wanted to explain why I'm showing a decrease and while they're talking about an increase. Uh, those changes will also increase the um, assessments for the 16 businesses listed up there. And again, that's really just kind of realigning the businesses as they've changed and grown over time to get them into the right categories. Uh, most of the changes are fairly small. There's a couple that are up there, but it's mostly, mostly due to the growth in those individual businesses. Um, and I would also like to point out, we hear a lot about businesses that close in the village, but we did have, I think we had 20 last year, but we did have 14 new businesses open during fiscal year 18, 19, so I just wanted to at least take a moment and list those up there so folks that weren't aware that they're open now in the village can, can go check them out. And that, oh, sorry. Um, so recommended action is to conduct the public hearing and adopt the proposed resolution levying the fiscal year 2019-20 Capitola Village Wharf Business Improvement Area Assessments and accepting the BIA annual plan and budget. And that's, that concludes my presentation. I would be happy to take questions. And Karin Hanna from the BIA is also here as well. Okay, uh, first, any questions from City Council? No? Okay, um, I'd like to invite Karn to come up, please. Um, we welcome your comments. Um, Karn Hanna from the Craft Gallery, and this is Daniel Castagnola from Castagnola's Deli. He's the vice chair of the BIA this year. Um, so good evening to everybody. 
Uh, one thing I wanted to say on great minds thinking alike, one of our discussion items at our last board meeting and at our marketing meeting is to put more hydration stations in the village. That <laughs> I think it's a real priority and because of the success we've been having with our uh, sip and strolls, which are fundraisers, and we have another Christmas fundraiser that we're planning a cookie walk where people can buy a tin that is a commemorative tin for the village and then take it around to all the businesses and get free cookies. 100% of the proceeds will go to a nonprofit. So all the, the, the sip and strolls and the cookie walk are all producing actually a fair amount of money. And then part of the TOT is to go to infrastructure improvement. So uh, recycling cans, maintenance of the recycling and trash, education about recycling and trash, and the rehydration stations are, um, you know, that's it. That's what we want to talk about. Uh, you know, we're slow moving because we're almost all volunteers. We just have a very few consultants that we pay. So it takes us a long time to get stuff done, but it's unanimous. Um, those items have unanimous support within the BIA. So I just wanted to, to touch on that since it came up today. And Daniel and I are here to ask, answer any questions. No, no questions, but I'm glad um, all the activities you do in the village are great. And uh, so I'm supporting um, our city council recommendation here to hydration stations. Definitely welcome. Good idea. Yeah, we hope we can help, you know, financially with some of that. And, you know, I'll be talking to public works and everything on how exactly that works and what kind of space and the infrastructure that goes into it. Okay. All right. Well, and thanks congratulations for Congratulations to the new vice <laughs> yep. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thanks for your continuing support. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else from the public would like to speak to this item? Seeing none, bring it back to City Council for action. I had a couple comments. I, I, I think it's great. Uh, I, I like the partnership between the city and the BIA. I think the, the new TOT tax and that infusion of money into the BIA is money well spent by the city. Uh, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that they're taking the money and, and doing things that are going to improve the village because that's the one thing we're all on the same page is, is just to improve the vibrancy of the village. I think the new rate structure is probably appropriate. It's long overdue. I think it's, uh, it, it benefits the businesses in the village to support themselves. So any increased money that can go into promoting the village I think is a good thing. So with that, I'm going to approve a, a, a staff recommendation for the budget. Second. Okay. It's been approved and second. Um, any more discussion? Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No one opposed. Um, please let Sam know. Thank you, Larry. They come back in. So I'd like to move on to um, sidewalk vending and compliance with Senate Bill 946. And uh, thank you, finance director. So, Director Hurley, I believe you have a presentation. Thank you, Mayor Chan, and good evening, Council. Uh, before you tonight, we have a, a discussion on sidewalk vending ordinances. Um, this past year, um, the Safe Sidewalk Vending Act was passed under SB 946, and it became effective in January of 2019. Um, within the state regulations, uh, there's new sidewalk vending regulations that permit sidewalk vending throughout um, the cities and counties of the state of California, and they apply to um, citywide within our residential areas and our commercial areas, and um, sidewalk vending is allowed within sidewalks, pathways, and parks. So big changes in terms of what's been allowed at the state level. Um, how can we protect ourselves from sidewalk vending and not have sidewalk vendors um, just roaming through our residential areas and commercial areas? Um, there are ways in which to prevent uh, or to protect our city. First, any new standards have to be based on public health, safety, and welfare that we establish. Um, we are allowed to put together time, place, and manner standards. Um, there's specific protections for parks. Um, within a park, we can set up standards to protect the public use and enjoyment of natural resources and recreational opportunities. We can also protect our parks so that there's not an, um, uh, just 
a highly concentrated area that of, of vendors that interferes with the park's scenic and natural resources. So when we start thinking about what our parks are, we, we have parks and open space within Capitola. And so when we go, when we start drafting this regulation and defining what a park is, we're going to want to bring in our open space areas, such as our beaches, and make sure that, you know, when we talk about uh, Capitola and what's so special, it's much of the natural resource areas, those recreational opportunities, those uh, views of the Monterey Bay, and starting to think about how, how we can protect those areas from our sidewalks, our pathways, and our parks. So um, as we get into the new regulations, um, tonight I just wanted to provide you with an overview of uh, what's to come and hear from you um, how you'd like us to set this up. If you'd like the regulations to be more limited, um, to, to limit um, vendors to an extent or be more protective in that um, we can create greater standards. So some examples are within sidewalks. The, under a limited regulation, the sidewalks could just maintain the ADA width of four feet. If we wanted to be a little more protective, we could set a standard of 10 feet um, for areas with high pedestrian activity. Um, and again, it has to be tied back to um, safety and health and welfare. So we'd have to make those findings in, in establishing the greater, um, the greater widths. Another is within the uh, state regulations, you're allowed to establish um, separation from farmers markets and swap meets and special events. So within a limited criteria, you could create a space actually within your farmers markets or your swap meets for street vendors and allow them to be there just within a defined area. To be more protective, we could have a setback from the actual farmers market special event um, areas such as I've seen, I think it's in the city of Carmel, a 200 foot setback from those areas. So for art and wine festival, having a, a setback from that or just our Sunday art in the park. Can you, can you, paint that picture for me. I don't, I don't know what you mean by setback. Oh, a separation, a buffer. So the vendor would have to be 10 feet from. Oh, so sorry. So let's that's let's take I, a step back. Yeah, okay, I'm, so within I'm the confused. sidewalk, um, we could have a regulation for health and safety that, actually we have to have a, a, a regulation for ADA. So you have to have a clearance on all sidewalks of four feet. So if a sidewalk is only four feet wide, a vendor could not set up on a four foot wide set sidewalk because they would be in the way of your ADA um, um, requirement. But if you wanted to take it to the next step, so today um, walking through the village around noon, our sidewalks are packed and last night at the concert, the sidewalks are packed. So um, high pedestrian areas, we could increase that, that with based on the fact for health and safety reasons, if there were street vendors all along the Esplanade last night as people are coming to and from the concert, it creates a health and safety issue because there's just simply not enough width on that sidewalk. So setting the standard larger in areas where there's high pedestrian activity. So within the second one for farmers markets, we're allowed to protect for farmers markets, swap meets, um, and special events. So there you could either permit it, you could allow a special area within each of those events, or you can create a buffer. So to say if there's a farmer's market, the sidewalk vendors have to be 100 feet away from the farmer's market. Um, another portion of this is with uh, time regulations. Within the commercial areas, you're not allowed to limit the times. They have to uh, beyond what's allowed for a, a business in a commercial area. But within residential areas, you are allowed to limit those times so they can be more restrictive. So in a, um, in a limited ordinance, you, we could limit those times from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. But if we wanted to be more restrictive, it could be from 8 to 6. So it's really what's right for Capitola in limiting those hours and, and knowing what it would be um, good for the welfare of our people in Capitola. Um, and then roaming um, versus stationary vendors. So within parks, there's also an allowance that if, if the city has an exclusive concession stand within a park, 
such as we do in Esplanade Park with the um, beach rentals, then the city can prohibit additional stationary vendors within that park. Um, and, but we do have to allow roaming vendors within parks to an extent. So um, some places have put in standards within park of a number of vendor license per acre. So a way to limit it so that we're still protecting, um, as I had shown in the previous slide, you know, our natural resources and recreational opportunities. So there's a way in which to limit those numbers even further beyond just health and safety standards. So this evening, what I was hoping to receive from the city council was direction on how do we want to approach this standard, um, the standards. In larger cities, it seems to be they're, you know, they're not placing maximum number of um, licenses. They're a little less restrictive in areas that are similar to us, like Carmel, they're, because of the, no, their, um, how their city has been built out with narrower sidewalks and less opportunities for vendors to be selling on their sidewalks, I would say they have a more protective ordinance in place. So what I was hoping to do is kind of get a gauge uh, from you of where we should be establishing these regulations um, in terms of limited or protective. And then in September, I plan to come back with an ordinance and then we can start fine tuning it at that point. And you know, if we have an eight foot wide sidewalk and we'll, we'll bring data on our sidewalk widths and you think it should be bumped up to 10, we can fine tune it during that next meeting. But this is really to gauge whether or not we should have many street vendors um, and you don't think it would be a health and safety issue throughout Capitola or if it should be more limited, more restricted. So that concludes my presentation. Okay, I'll open for discussion. No, more questions, questions. excuse questions. me, I'm sorry. No questions. No questions, okay. Uh, Sam. Sam. Oh, no. <laughs> I thought you wanted no. to, okay. No, sorry. Sam, yeah. sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for the report. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one, um, I know restaurants are subject to the county health um, um, department and county health codes and inspections. Are these street vendors subject to the same requirements? They are. So they're subject to business licenses um, and any state regulations, and also they'd be subject to the health requirements. Right. And which I guess that goes to my second question. So we would be able to require that they be licensed and inspected if we were going to permit them anywhere? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so is there any anticipation that the new town center, formerly the mall, would be wanting vendors of any sort? So would these regulations uh, be done in conjunction with them? Have we reached out to them? I don't even know if this is an issue. So that's private property that would be treated differently. So that okay. would be um, outdoor display of goods or a special event permit. But, but that would be private property. That's but they all could theirs. build it in within a conditional use permit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how about um, our wharf? Mm -hmm. The wharf would not fall under a street or sidewalk. So it's... Because I know I've been to cities where the wharfs have vendors and they mm -hmm. actually have all sorts of things going on in the wharf um, from entertainment to food sales and such. So I was just wondering, would that fall under this? The public facility? Well, maybe we it's could a public find facility. So, I mean, I think the easiest answer would be the new state law. I don't believe, I could be corrected, but I don't believe that the new state law would require us to have vending on the wharf. But that does, that would be an item that if the council wanted to adopt an ordinance and include in the sidewalk vending ordinance allowances or specific restrictions to the wharf, it would be within your discretion to do so. Okay. But I don't and think you're mandated under this new state law to consider it. Okay, and this is perhaps a stupid question, but I've got to ask it. So there's public right away, like Riverwalk. I mean, that's private property, correct? So it's not an issue there. I think I think it is. Those public paths are identified as as. Um, oh, so it law. could be there too on Riverwalk. So the Riverwalk could be um, up on Depot Hill, the um, pathway looking right along the bluffs. Yeah, those are public pathways that. Um, could be subject to vendors. 
Okay, I stand corrected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what, what I was trying to get at with the definition of parks, we're probably going to want to pull in some of our open space and trail areas into our definition in order to protect those areas. So I thought on the bluff that was private property that the city maintains, but it's owned by citizens in that area. It's actually um, a street right-of-way that's no longer a um, functioning street right-of-way. Okay. Grand Avenue. Okay. Thank you very much. So it is public. Okay. Um, I think uh, just for City Council's edification, in the new uh, magazine, Western, who is it, Western? Western City. Yeah, they have a great article on this. So if you look at the new Western City. So at this point, I'd um, like to open it to uh, public comment. I never would have guessed you would have come up. It's so convenient that both these items were on I the know. same agenda. <laughs> um, we discussed this at our, uh, we sent the notice out to um, all the businesses in the village. And Thank we do you. have quite a few businesses represented today that responded to that. Good. And we discussed it at our last meeting and um, we did take like a straw vote. We didn't have a motion or anything like that, but um, it was a unanimous vote that we would, we would recommend the more restrictive plan. I think that's, you know, it's pretty much in keeping with the way it's been. It's been working really well. Um, very few people have even attempted to be um, selling on the sidewalk. People ask me about it all the time. Can I come down and start selling my jewelry that I make and I set up on the seawall? And, you know, it's, it, it, that's been kept at bay and I think that, that most of us really um, appreciate that. So the feeling was um, the more restrictive would be better. Um, I got a few emails um, and Sierra from Lumen Gallery asked me to state that she definitely feels that the res mo more restrictive the better that uh, sidewalk vending um, would go against what uh, most of the businesses have been trying to create um, in the village. So, uh, and then there's some other businesses here that might have it, but our, our, our vote in the BIA was unanimous to go for the more, more restrictive plan. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Anyone else that's come that Karn has mentioned from the BIA? Okay. Um, any more comments from the city? Those who are coming here? No. Okay. Bring it back to city council for action. I'd be happy to make a motion. Okay. Um, I motion to have staff move forward with creating an ordinance that is highly restrictive in time, place, and manner standards. Second. Second. So it's been motioned and second. Any more discussion? Yeah, just a quick comment. I, I just hope that, that what that implies is that we can adopt the most protective restrictions that are allowed by the state. Is that what? Is that how you that's interpret clear. that? Okay. Thank you. I think that is okay. So, with that in mind, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. Okay, it passes. So moving on to consider an appeal of Embark. So item D, capital is section of the city uh, committed decision to Mr. issue. Mr. Mayor, what? I want to call just a, what? I think you lost one of your peers. You may want to call a three minute break here. Oh, I didn't, oh, she just disappeared. Okay, uh, a little recess, thank you. Pause for the cause. Pause, <laughs> yes, pause, okay. <laughs> I'm going to get some water. Here, I'll fill you up. Yep, no problem. Since you've been doing a lot of talking, you're already up here. I've been losing it. This is an official break. Exactly. Yes. That's going to be an unusual one. I don't know when I'm going to wear it, but. <laughs> uh. 
that would be, you know, I should try to get to uh, We should get the picture. Yes. Well, we have two pictures. Those are pictures that I know. Yeah, they're not going to be good. Yeah. Oh, many ways you would wait. Well, probably the traffic. You know, he actually was here in five minutes ago. If he was going to do it again in the service, because five minutes is kind of close. He should have said, I think it was quarter to or something like that. But he was on time. Is it? Oh, okay. We like to do this thing now. We for a couple minutes to set up and get the letters out and get our tapes on. And right. All right, that works out. We would use another Part 68 map. We'll bring it up now. I haven't done that. One year I was tapped because they didn't have someone for the locals. One thing I'd like to do in this video is we don't have a lot of um, feral locals. So I was talking to Willie, you know, he was complaining last year there's not a lot of bear folks. And this year I'm going to try to get some feral. Well, that's what I'm trying to think of. <laughs> right. They, they collect food all the time. Yeah, but there's only there's there's there could be a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Get our oh, everyone left. Well, well you started. Time, the last time I asked for a break, no one gave it to me, so I was like, I'm gonna. Oh, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If you ask for something, you always get it. Hey, wait a minute. I was gonna snap that. Because <laughs> you can't get them. When, when you ask for something, that's right. You always get it. Sam ate all his. Oh, what? You have some right there. Yeah, I covered them up. Do you want it? Which one do you have? Oh, no. I'll take well, you the. You can uh, have the M and M. You can't have the almond deal. Oh, there I was going to go for the almond deal. I know. <laughs> I was going to steal yours, but I remembered you love them. No, okay. I'm going to hide these too. Ever, anyone could have my Milky Way. That's up. Kristen doesn't want it. Quorum is back again, so for item D, I'd like to request a process overview by Chief McManus. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, Mayor Bertrand, members of the council. The next item before you this evening is uh, an appeal of the City of Capitola. Um, Chief, um, I just have a, a moment here. I'm awfully sorry. Yes, sir. Are there any comments uh, from members of the City Council on this particular item? I think we wanted to um, provide an opportunity to express any ex parte communications at this time. Um, and so I think it would just be appropriate um, that I announce that during the application process, before the decision was made, um, we received requests from several applicants to meet. Uh, and I did meet briefly um, with the applicants from Embark Capitola. And I would like to uh, share that as an ex parte communication. And I too have met with um, Embark on two occasions. Yeah, and I met with representatives from Embark before the decision was made on one occasion. Um, I was reached out to also. I did not meet with any of them, and um, so I did not talk to any of the uh, applicants. And I think Ed I, did not. Same. I was reached out to. I did not talk to any applicants. Okay. So, um, sorry to interrupt you, Chief. Mayor Bertrand, members of council, the item before you this evening is uh, an appeal of the City of Capitola's retail cannabis licensing process, and I'm happy to provide a presentation. Uh, by way of background, yeah, you'll recall that in November of 2018, uh, Measure I passed locally the cannabis business tax. Um, and in essence, the, uh, the passage of that, that measure introduced the city's retail can cannabis license ordinance, which became effective uh, shortly after the passage in, in the following month. The um, uh, ordinance 5.36, our local ordinance, allows up to two retail cannabis license permits here in the city. Uh, and with the passage of that, that uh, measure, staff began the process of uh, coordinating the, uh, the application process here locally. That application period opened on January 1 of this year. Um, immediately upon the passage of the measure, uh, staff got together uh, and, and uh, wanted to consider the, the means of creating the most comprehensive application form itself. Um, and so we relied upon uh, a good amount of feedback locally from the three cities in the county, uh, County of Santa Cruz, City of Santa Cruz, and Watsonville, who have uh, viable and rather robust programs currently. And we wanted to um, uh, gain some knowledge from them to hopefully rely upon some best practices locally. 
uh, as well as best practices from many of the cities throughout the state. Uh, as you're probably aware, I've been a, uh, a member of the California Police Chiefs Cannabis Committee since June of 27, so I was able to reach out to quite a few of my colleagues uh, as we were enter staff was entering into the process of creating the actual application uh, for this program. We also consulted with our cannabis consultant from uh, HDL, uh, as well as the local expert in the county uh, who works for the Santa Cruz Can County Cannabis Licensing Office. One of the things that we decided early on uh, was to not require the identification of a site as part of our application. Uh, and the reason we did that, and, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory, I want to go over a couple of the points. As you're well aware, within the uh, regional commercial uh, zone in the city, it's a very small restricted area. And in fact, Capitola Road north to the freeway and then both sides of, of 44, so that's, the that's the restricted area. Uh, and so the, as the police chief, the crime potential or the actual crime in this restricted area is, is very much the same from one end of the, the regional commercial zone and to the other end. And so it wasn't uh, sig a significant consideration at all as it relates to the requirement, as some other municipalities have asked for, uh, in the submission of the application itself. The other thing we didn't want to do is limit uh, potential applications. Uh, we wanted to expand it so that we could, as a city and staff, um, interview those, those applicants that were representative of the type of partners that we were in the community would like to work with in the cannabis uh, program. Uh, and also we have the CUP process to rely upon uh, as part of the application and selection process, whereupon if there were some site-specific considerations, either on the law enforcement side uh, or the city side, through the CU CUP process, we could consider or introduce some conditions that might mitigate some of those concerns. So, uh, repeat myself, that we went forward without uh, the need for applicants to identify a site. The application submittal period was from January 1st uh, through uh, April 2nd. There were 14 applications submitted. Uh, those applications were submitted to the police department. Uh, and I thought it was really important that we identify as a staff a single person who would be the contact person for all of the applicants uh, so that they had face-to-face -face contact. We had consistency in message messaging as we were introducing this new uh, program and answering several questions, as a matter of fact. And so I identified one of my administrative uh, uh, analysts downstairs in the police department uh, to be the contact person for all of the applicants. Uh, she was tasked with uh, uh, receiving the applications, 14 of them, um, confirming the, the completeness of the submission, uh, signatures, very important, uh, proof of live scan for those, uh, those partners within each of the uh, organizations. Um, and in fact, and this is good news, all 14 of the applications passed uh, that initial review and moved into phase one of the process, which was the application technical review process. That technical review timeline initially was uh, April 17th uh, through May 2nd. It needed to be extended because we were still in the process of identifying best practices locally uh, and, and ideally beyond the local area, uh, as well as identifying the three non-conflicted panelists who we were going to ask to participate in this uh, application review process. Um, as you read there in our, our ordinance 536, uh, no fewer than three non-conflicted individuals as selected by the city manager uh, were going to represent that panel. Now this was not a face-to-face -face interview. This was a technical review of all 14 of the applications um, reflective of our, com our competitive merit-based uh, uh, license review that is described in 536. And some of the things that that panel uh, was considering, uh, they may consider as part of their, of their review um, we could ignore potential crime at the proposed location. That is in 536, but I think I've explained that uh, we did not require a site uh, as part of the application. The criminal, um, uh, potential civil criminal background of applicants and other parties, uh, experience in cannabis, uh, other retail sales, uh, problems and issues with other uh, cannabis uh, retail outlets, if there were any, uh, local enterprise, uh, understandably within the uh, region, and then uh, information specific to the actual site. When I talk about site, I'm talking about um, the, we've learned in the state of California, the site security plans are fairly consistent because it's mandated by the state of California. And there are some local mandates as well. So when I say site, I'm not talking about an address. I'm talking about a proposed operation. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit further in a minute. One of the things that was really important, we spent a lot of time trying to um, uh, develop, and in fact, we did develop 
an actual scoring sheet. This is attachment number one in your packet. And this is the first page of that attachment. It's about a five page attachment. But I thought it was important to present this uh, as part of this hearing to demonstrate our very meticulous uh, competitive merit-based process that we introduced and the reliance upon best practices, again, locally and beyond. Uh, and so when you look at this, there were five uh, actual um, areas of review that we determined uh, as a staff and relying upon experts, including especially our consultant, uh, cannabis consultant from HDL. Uh, and one of those five, uh, for instance, in this slide is a statement of purpose. This was a 100-point 100, 100 scoring system for the application technical application review. Uh, you're looking at the statement of purpose, and then if you look to the right there, the factors to consider, there are several of them. What we wanted to do, if we listed a factor, and we decided upon this, uh, these factors as a staff, when we listed a factor, we wanted to identify a source uh, that was specific to that factor. For instance, uh, providing medical cannabis, we know that that's a community benefit. Uh, providing cannabis for select individuals, um, cost reduction opportunities, that's also a community benefit. If you go now a little bit further, for instance, green business certified, that's captured in our local climate action plan. So when we identified anchors, if you will, or factors, we thought it was important as best we could uh, to identify the source that they came from. And so this is an example of the five page scoring tool that the three panelists used uh, to individually score each of the 14 applications. That technical review process, it was a two-day process. It took place on May 8th and 9th of this year, and as I mentioned, a three-person technical review panel. Uh, our uh, uh, cannabis uh, consultant from HTL, HDL was on the panel. Um, the expert from San, uh, Santa Cruz County's Cannabis Licensing Office, uh, he was on the panel, as was a representative from the city. In fact, Captain Daly from my police department was on the panel. Uh, that three-person panel on those two days, the 8th and 9th, um, did a full review of all 14 applications, and each of those applications was individually scored on a 100-point uh, uh, system based upon the factors that uh, are included in attachment one, the scoring sheet. What you're looking at here is the result of the technical review of the 14 applications and all of the scores from a high score of 93.67 to a low score of 64.17. Uh, the three parties to this appeal are listed appropriately on this slide, Embark, Apothecarium, and Treehouse. Uh, the others were not listed. Uh, I'm gonna switch to the next slide here where you, where you can see, which is typically and often the case in my experience, where uh, we were able to identify the top six of the group of 14. And we're able to do that based upon score alone. Um, when you look there, in this, in my 33 years in law enforcement and having been part of many uh, technical reviews and face-to-face -face interviews, more often than not, you're able to separate the top group uh, from, from the bulk of the applicants or the interviewees. And in this case, that's exactly what happened with the top six there, uh, a range of scores from 93.6 to 86.8. So those were the finalists that moved forward from phase one, the technical review, uh, into phase two, which was the actual presentation. The six applicants um, uh, moved on uh, to phase two. The eight non-selects were notified uh, by way of U.S. mail of their failure to move from phase one into phase two. Uh, I made a personal call uh, to Dave McPherson, uh, our consultant with HDL. I was curious, he was a panelist, I was curious as to his thoughts of our finalist group. Um, and so we had a short conversation. He shared with me that based upon his expert opinion, all six met the minimum qualification to proceed and were all, in his opinion, considered relatively equal. Uh, and so going forward to phase two, the interview process, all six of the finalists um, were relatively equal going into that process. Uh, again, we had a single uh, point of contact within the police department who notified each of the finalists and scheduled a 25-minute presentation on May 20th, uh, followed by a 15-minute uh, Q&A. Um, the finalists who inquired about the interview and the process of phase two were provided this information that you see in front of you and nothing more than that. You'll see there that it's not all inclusive. This is a list of some of the factors that we had discussed as a staff from the very beginning, shortly after the passage of Measure I in November, 
up until this point of areas that we would certainly be interested in learning about with each of the now six finalists and even previously with the 14 applications. Um, I did not want to provide a roadmap to all the six finalists and provide them every piece of information that we uh, as a, uh, a panel, interview panel, were going to be evaluating, but I wanted to provide them some information as a guide so that they felt comfortable going into the next process. Uh, and in <coughs> fact, our point of contact with the police department was the individual who provided that information uh, to each of the finalists who asked for it. And you can look at some of the items there as we're talking. Projected taxable revenues, that's important. Uh, vertical integration. Uh, the local 7% tax um, uh, law here. Well, what were their thoughts on that? And several of the others that you see up there on the, on the slide to include um, the demonstration of their ownership structure, uh, financial position, et cetera. The interview panel participants, again, relying upon uh, our ordinance 5.36. Uh, and that no fewer than three non-conflicted individuals were going to make up the panel as selected by the city manager. Um, those individuals were, in fact, the finance director, Jim Malberg, myself as the police chief, uh, Captain Andy Daly, and our city manager. Uh, those interviews or uh, presentations took place, uh, as I mentioned, on May 20th, uh, and six finalists. We used a forced ranking system um, to rate each of the presentations. And this is contained in two slides because I couldn't contain all of it on one slide. And, and I would assume that uh, the majority of council, if not all, are familiar with the forced ranking system. But I think it's important that I touch on how it works a little bit. If you look at the top there under reviewer one, and there were four reviewers. On the far left, uh, simply stated, the first interview is, in this instance, is firm A. Uh, they're the first one to interview on the 20th, and so they finish first. As you move to the right, the second interview, uh, in this case, Apothecarium was a second presenter. Um, they finished above Firm A, and so that's the ranking after two interviews. And if you move all the way to the right to the sixth interview, which happened to be Treehouse, uh, that is the ranking order from reviewer number one for all of the finalists, all six of the presentations. Uh, you're looking at reviewer two down below, and as I switch the slide here, uh, these are the results from reviewer number three and reviewer number four. Uh, that highlighted area, I just highlighted that, and, and I need to mention that in the um, package, the attachment, there's, there's a typo. It says firm F in your attachment. It's actually firm E. It's a simple typo. We know that firm F, the last presenter, is Treehouse. Uh, and uh, on this slide, they are at the top on both uh, reviewer three and reviewer four. Uh, really important, I think, to mention the amount of consistency uh, using this forced ranking system. Each of the panelists ranked the, the presenters, the finalists, individually, uh, and then it was captured uh, at the conclusion of the interviews, um, which each, with each panelist providing their uh, forced ranking results. All four of the panelists ranked uh, uh, Treehouse and Apothecarium in either the first or the second position and three of the four ranked Embark in position number four with one reviewer number four, as you can see, ranking Embark in position number three. So we were really comfortable after the two-phase process and the conclusion of the presentations on the 20th of May um, to identify the Apothecarium Capitola and Treehouse, Treehouse Capitola as our potential licensees. Uh, but we still had an obligation uh, by way of due process to do some follow-up uh, and some background work on those two potential licensees. Captain Daly took the lead on that. Uh, the Apothecarium Capitola, um, they're, they're based, for lack of a better word, they have uh, retail businesses in the city of San, San Francisco. And so Captain Daly contacted the uh, uh, San Francisco Police Department as well as their community development department asking questions about how is the operation with Apothecarium in your city. They've been there for a good amount of time. Uh, they were, were very complimentary of uh, Apothecarium and their operations. They cited that they were great partners with the city. And so that we, we were comfortable in our conversations with San Francisco uh, with uh, Apothecarium as one of our potential licensees here in our city. Uh, they, or Andy, Captain Daly also visited uh, locally the Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance, their operation in Watsonville. Santa Cruz, uh, as you're 
uh, probably aware, Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance uh, is a partner with Apothecarium. And so we contacted the city of Watsonville, uh, the same type of process Captain Daly did. He visited the business location in Watsonville, uh, and each, each pieces were very compl complimentary of that operation in Watsonville. We did the same thing with Treehouse. That's a local uh, Capitola retail outlet uh, in the county on SoCal. And so we visited that um, retail business, uh, did some follow-up with, uh, with Sam Laforte from the county. Uh, he's the lead person with their cannabis uh, um, uh, unit within the county, uh, and asked him about uh, Treehouse uh, and their operation, any concerns, uh, their uh, willingness to work with the community, uh, and very, Sam and others, very complimentary of that operation as well. And so we were comfortable going forward with, after this part of the due process, with announcing that the Apothecarium Capitola and Treehouse Capitola were in fact the two potential licensees selected as part of the application process. On May 28th, we notified formally uh, those two uh, potential licensees by way of a letter delivered from the city manager uh, to Apothecarium and Treehouse themselves, while at the same time notifying uh, by way of letter to the remaining four applicants who did not, do, who did not move forward in the process. On June 13th, uh, we received the notice of appeal uh, pursuant to our ordinance 5.36 uh, from Embark uh, appealing our um, uh, uh, Capitola's uh, retail cannabis process. Um, I think it's important that I jump down towards the bottom there under Capitola Municipal Code 2.52 uh, and mentioned to council, although I'm assuming that you're well aware of this, issues considered on appeal are limited to those raised in the notice of appeal. Uh, and I wanted to start there because I think it's important for this part of the process that I actually read the four issues that were revealed or introduced in the notice of appeal uh, for council and for the public. Number one, the city did not proceed in a manner required by law. Number two, because the statute does not mandate consistent application of its review standards, it violated due process. Number three, the selection panel's decision was based on information of which the appellant was not apprised and had no opportunity to controvert or argue. An appellant was denied a meaningful hearing. And finally, number four, the panel's selection process was tainted by the consideration of false, fraudulent, or misleading information. Uh, I'm very comfortable, I'm speaking for uh, staff in the, in, in the city, and we're real comfortable uh, in our process, I think that we demonstrated a very uh, competitive merit-based process as we committed to with the introduction of our code in 5.36. Uh, and I believe the appeal is based upon inaccurate assumptions uh, and or assertions. And I look forward to the opportunity of speaking further on that after the appellant presents their case. Thank you. Any questions of the chief for clarification? Sam. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chief, one uh, follow-up question. Um, when you noticed the applicants of phase two um, and you had a screen that um, laid out the information communicated to finalists, did the uh, appellant, did they um, inquire with you about those um, areas of interest that would be asked at the interview? Not all of them, but several of them did. I think four of the six did. The right. Did the appellant, the appellant in Park, in, uh, I'm sorry, Embark, in fact, did communicate with my analyst asking for that information. Okay, great. And you gave them that information. I did, yes, on May right. 15th. Great, thank you. you want a question? Yeah. No. Oh, Ed. Yeah, just curious. Did the technical score have any weight on the final interview whatsoever? All finalists entered phase two relatively equal. It had no weight on the... Uh, there was no... But if you place first on that list, that had no bearing or no impact on what your final score would be. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. And that decision to do it that way was based in part of the consultation that the chief um, alluded to in his presentation with HDL, our, ta our sales tax, our cannabis tax consultant, who advised on that very issue about whether or not we should treat them equally, and the, their recommendation was that they were relatively equal at this stage. Okay, um, I think we should move on to the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Chief. So at this point, um, we have um, a presentation from Embark for its case of 10 minutes. Uh, City Clerk, please, uh, you have. Thank you very much. 
May I, um, we uh, ask a couple of housekeeping measures first? Uh, yeah, uh, please I reset noticed, the clock. Thank you. Uh, I did not see our materials, our reply to the staff report in the packet in back, so we sent it electronically. I tried to reach out to the city manager earlier, but I want to make sure that you have these materials. Uh, may I approach the bench? No, no, please no. hand it to the city clerk. Thank when, you. when were those sent to the city? Uh, they were provided electronically. I don't, I don't know the exact time. I did not receive anything. Yeah, I if, didn't receive it myself. I want to make sure that you have them now. Okay. Now also, here's some letters from other applicants. I assume they're in the record, but they're not in your packet. Um, city Clerk, can you pass those to us? And I just need a copy. Thanks. Oh, was this set at 455 today? I wouldn't know the answer. I was uh, headed over this way. That, that does appear to be the case. It, it appears that we received something at 4.55 this evening. Okay. Um, and then, um, uh, Honorable... Hold, hold on just a second. I have a, a question of our, question. Of our uh, legal counsel. Um, uh, legal counsel, I have a question. Uh, should we take some time to review this material before he continues this presentation? I've actually taken an opportunity during the extended jewel box discussion to look at those materials. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. At the conclusion of the city staff's rebuttal, the council does have the discretion to ask additional follow-up questions. I'd be happy to address the reply, reply memorandum that was delivered at the 11th hour and 59th minute uh, by uh, Mr. Massara and the law firm that represents the appellants. And I, I have only one copy, it appears, of each. Okay. So, um, I guess we'll just. To the representative to embark, um, our legal counsel will give a summary. Quick, quick question. Oh, okay. Um, I, I just want, um, can you give us uh, some point discussion about uh, his. Um, sure. Okay. Sure. Because I want to see this that. This is a pretty typical tactic you'll see where an individual will come at the last second to deliver a bunch of material to a decision making body in the effort to get the decision making body to continue the hearing. They've already requested a continuous hearing. There's no need writing. to disparage okay. the okay. appellant so, here. So uh, the City Council will, will receive your comments and will consider your comments. Correct. Thank and you I very think much. at the end would be an appropriate time because it's their final reply brief. And if you have yeah, questions I, about I just them, they want to read everything. Yeah, so. Okay. So, Ed? Just for clarification, I just had a question to the city clerk. To your knowledge, you had not received these prior to this meeting? I had not. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, to your, uh, we, we do not have time to read this, but we're going to accept these I, comments. We respectfully you. request 15 minutes, Your Honor, uh, and then five minutes for rebuttal. There's obviously been a lot of material and explanation associated with the staff report. In, to reply to the city attorney, part of the reason that it's been difficult to get these materials to you earlier is we're just still receiving the uh, tail end of the public records request. Okay, uh, so you were given an opportunity earlier to ask for extended time. I believe the city manager did approach you, so um, you did I not take- I approached the city manager actually. Okay. But I didn't um, get a response. Hold on a second. Would the members of the city council like to give this representative more time so that we go to 15 minutes? I I would give two more minutes. Two more minutes? Yeah. Okay. I'll bump it up to 12. 12? Okay. So we'll give you 12 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the Council. I'm Mark Massara, uh, and I have um, the privilege tonight of representing Embark on their appeal. Uh, we're grateful for this opportunity uh, for the appeal and to be able to discuss with you Capitola's dispensary permit process and Municipal Code Section 5.36. Essentially, we have just two issues uh, for your consideration, the legal issues and then the ethical problems associated with this process. The legal problem is obvious enough. The process as prescribed by the Municipal Code has been irretrievably broken and tainted by explicit deviations from the required process and by demonstrable affirmative misrepresentations by certain applicants in violation of their executed business affidavits as part of the process that in turn led city staff to play contortionist with the rules of engagement by adding phases and substituting new panel members and even selectively conducting field trips, site visits, and unfair ex parte rendezvous with the winner, 
all in flagrant disregard of the original published rules pertaining to the dispensary permit process. The legal issues are definitely set forth uh, in our PowerPoint presentation. Well, Larry, can you give him a hand, please? Thank you. Um, our IT, uh, he's not, um, our assistant will be taking care of that. Hold, hold on. If we could stop the clock. Yeah. Briefly, first, uh, your staff did not proceed according to the clearly prescribed code section 5.36. After all, Embark won the application process per the code. Two, uh, but then staff invented phase two with a new criteria and a new panel with new members without publication or public notice. Um, three, there was no notice to applicants regarding the new criteria, which is especially disconcerting given your staff's contention now in the staff report and the city attorney's analysis that, that the city doesn't need to abide by any criteria. Either way, the process clearly violated Embark's and the other applicants' due process rights. Worst of all, the new phase two panel members relied on and made decisions and choices based on misleading affirmative misrepresentations regarding fraudulent materials provided by Jason Sweat and Apothecarium deliberately designed to imply their right to use a facility that had been under the exclusive lease right of Embark. And while staff tonight has attempted to discount the notion of having a site, it was in fact a critical component in every aspect of this process. And how could it not be? So the legal issues are prominent enough, yet despite the obvious legal issues, it's the practical, political, and moral problem that should give you your staff, the city, and Capitola residents the most heartburn. In fact, if this process had concluded in an orderly manner, legal problems associated with it could probably have been overlooked. But because of how the process ended, your political problem is metastatized. The issue is this, your rules required honesty and prohibited misrepresentations. This is the business affidavit that was required for all applicants. It requires honesty, it prohibits falsifications, it's not optional, it's mandatory, it's executed under penalty of perjury, it requires truth, it prohibits misrepresentations. Following the written application process, however, it became clear that one of the principals was not honest at all, but had instead engaged in a deliberate, knowing fraud and a scam, and perversely, he won following the phase two interviews and the opaque field trips, both of which fell outside the prescribed municipal code process. So now we know following the Public Records Act information disclosure and you know that local Embark principal Jason Sweat was fraudulently playing both sides of the fence, pretending to be an exclusive representative for Embark while in fact secretly partnering with Atherpicarium. And worse, Jason misappropriated Embark's exclusive site location to represent that site on behalf of Apothecarium. Here you see it plain as day. In case you or your phase two interview panel are confused, note even the physical street address is exactly the same as the exclusive Embark site. This is what Apothecarium provided to you as what they intended to provide you with, uh, with a dispensary. Slide six, uh, or slide seven is the landlord's letter. Now, it, say you're still confused. Say, you, you know, like your staff, you claim there's no prejudice, there's no unfairness, say you believe you had no duty to question Jason about the scam, or you didn't realize that despite being in back-to-back -back interviews in this phase two process, no one asked, how is it possible? You know, let's look at the letter from the landlord of 1850 41st Avenue. Hopefully, that's clear enough. 
okay, this, this is bad enough, right? Embark is in, ashamed and embarrassed not to have uncovered this scam sooner, not to have notified you and the city sooner, or that you neglected to inform us sooner, et cetera. But all of this would likely not mean anything significant as had his, uh, had this secret alliance not become the winner in your contorted application sweepstakes process, but it did. Jason and Apothecarian actually did win as a result of their fraud. That makes this bigger than simply Embark's problem. It makes it your problem. And that's why this matters. And that's why that you must uphold this appeal. There are only two conclusions that can be drawn. Either Jason won because you, like us, were duped in this scam, in which case we're all in this together, or something more sinister occurred where your staff either knew or should have known and didn't say anything, didn't alert you or embark to Jason's fraud, either during the phase two interviews or thereafter. And you might wonder, how can I say that? Because as part of this strange post hoc phase two appendage to the original authorized application process, Jason and Apothecarium interviewed prior to Embark and Jason interviewing. And despite that, not a single word was said, not a single question was asked. Like, for example, Jason, how do you intend to manage both partnerships if you win? Jason, if both parties win, who will actually use the site at 1850 41st Avenue? Jason, how can you represent that Apocatharium will use 1850 41st Avenue when Embark and the landlord for the property both represent that Embark has exclusive right to that property? Jason, if you're a partner in Embark, how could you allow Apothecarium to use a visual simulation for a site you know is not available? That plainly violates the business affidavit. Instead, crickets. Despite the fact that the PRA request and interview notes for Apothecarian demonstrate that they misappropriated and used Embark's exclusive site for their visual rendering and that the site and that visual, visual rendering was discussed in the interview, not a single interviewer asked a question about Embark using the same site in its interview. How could this have occurred? It defies belief. In other words, it's inescapable that the process is tainted and legally defective and violates both the municipal code itself and the explicit terms of the application process and the business affidavit, wherein applicants were required to be honest. Under any scrutiny or analysis, Jason was not honest. Apothecarium was not honest. Thus, the inevitable conclusion is that, this pro is that this process, which was required by the city code, has been irretrievably tainted, both legally and morally, both in letter and in spirit. These affirmative misrepresentations and fraudulent misconduct are in direct violation and contravention, contravention of the city's published rules. It is therefore legally mandated that you and the city reset this process and hand this process over to an independent third party for correction. And fortunately enough, HDL is already assisting the city with their experience and expertise, we're confident that they can get the job done in compliance with the ordinance and avoid the legal and political train wreck caused by one bad actor who single-handedly caused havoc on the entire dispensary application process. Thank you. Thank you very much. So at this point, we're going to city staff response. We'll give the same amount of time. 12 minutes. 12 minutes.
Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. I'm going to start off uh, our uh, rebuttal. We'll talk about a couple of uh, very clear factual inaccuracies and in, in assumption. And in fact, no other applicant asserted that they had at lease or site control for 1850 uh, 41st Street. Uh, while other applicants provided, as mentioned, conceptual designs um, and renderings of potential designs for specific sites, they clearly articulated uh, during the interview that they did not have a lease um, currently for any site. The Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance, although it suggested uh, that their participation, at least in the appeal, um, was detrimental to the appellant's uh, interview. In fact, uh, Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance participation um, was a benefit, was an asset to the presenters. If you look at the final scores, uh, Embark uh, and Apothecarium finished one in four out of 14 total applications. So the suggestion uh, or the uh, presentation that, that uh, the participation uh, was a detriment to Embark, uh, in fact, is not true. Embark was not ranked as highly as other applicants in the interview process due to two primary factors. Uh, based upon the interview, the CEO had no prior experience in cannabis, cannabis dispensaries or operations based upon the presentation um, and the interview. And Embark was unable to articulate their actual or proposed ownership structure. Uh, on two occasions, two panelists uh, asked specifically direct questions related to the ownership of the organization. Uh, none of the presenters were either able or willing to answer questions about that ownership um, during the presentation. Um, one of the real important uh, reasons for, I believe, having the ability to have face-to-face -face, um, interaction and a face-to-face and -face interview uh, by way of a presentation with the finalists. The questions like this are important. Uh, and when those questions were asked twice to the Embark team, uh, they were simply not able to answer the question related to the ownership, stru ownership structure um, or weren't willing, and I'm not sure which one. Uh, I'm going to turn to our attorney now who's going to uh, provide more information with regard to the rebuttal to the appellant's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I would note just on the tail end of this slide, if I recall correctly, the ownership structure was one of the... Uh, criteria that was sent out to the finalists who asked for information about what would be considered. That was a specific item that was listed in the non-exclusive list. So it does beg a question if they knew that that topic was uh, going to be inquired on and they're unable to answer it. Um, it does beg, you know, consideration by the council. Uh, moving to the legal aspects of the appeal as opposed to some of the factual uh, assumptions and as you note in the actual appeal they do say on information and belief we assert the following and aside from uh, a single document that they have uh, that you've been shown as well which has a, a rendering of the address on it there's no I don't I didn't hear any factual testimony or any other source that suggested that these false representations were made so uh, an absence of facts if you will just to observe on that but going through their four points on appeal uh, you know as the chief has talked about, uh, the records demonstrate a diligent effort. This is a summary slide. I'm going to get into a more detailed slide next, but I'll jump ahead right now, in fact. Uh, I wanted to start with the first topic. It had four subheadings. The first one was failure to proceed in a manner required by law. Now, you saw in the city attorney analysis that I addressed each one of these points in turn. Uh, they first uh, argue that it's an abuse of discretion, which is a pretty difficult standard. You have to act arbitrarily, capriciously, and entirely lacking in evidentiary support for the decision you made. As described by the chief, I don't believe that what has been articulated as what the city staff did constitutes an arbitrary and capricious decision. In fact, it seems to be a reasoned, considered decision uh, based on some, you know, application of criteria by uh, numerous individuals who all came to similar conclusions. Uh, that's not a uh, arbitrary and capricious decision um, just based on their assertion that it is. Uh, the burden of proof, I should note here, is on the appellants, too. 
Embark LLC is, or Cap Embark Capital LLC is the one who has to prove the points that they're making to you today. They can suppose and suggest and hypothesize, but they have to prove it. And I didn't hear anything uh, suggesting that um, uh, there was proof behind a lot of the allegations. But the first subheading was a consistency with the, uh, the, co the code itself, the Capital and Municipal Code. And one of the issues that they've identified, and they've also identified this in their reply brief, which I'll talk about later, is that the city acted outside of the factors that were listed in the statute. And th based on a very interesting argument that the word may is a restrictive word and that it means may only consider the following, uh, that's just simply not the appropriate statutory construction. As you well know, I've, I've dealt with a number of cases and, and defended statutory interpretations in the past. That's not a harmonious reading of the statute. It's not a logical reading of the statute. And it ignores ex expressed language in the statute that says the city may consider all of the following, including what's in the community's best interests. Uh, nowhere in their presentation and their materials do they acknowledge that there's another factor. They try to refuse any other interpretation other than the mandatory six. That's just not a reasonable interpretation uh, of the code. Uh, I should also note in their original appeal, the very last sentence here, they, they assert that our code references to a subsection 5.B, but it doesn't. And I think that underscores that the appellants here don't have a full grasp of the code. Their appeal document itself didn't accurately quote the ordinance. And I think that may have driven some of the misunderstandings that were associated with that. Subsection B is ignoring, quote, seemingly important criteria. Again, this is just a tangent of that prior argument, which is you, know, you have to consider all these things. Well, those things may be considered, but it's a legal axiom you'll hear. Weight versus admissibility. How much weight they give to any factor is entirely within the panel's discretion. And as long as they exercise that reasonably, uh, they are uh, acting lawfully. In this case, the city did not ignore seemingly important criteria, which also begs the question, important to whom? Now, maybe um, um, uh, Appellant Embark thinks it's particularly important because they had a lease locked down and they intended to use that to their advantage. But the city had determined that although that was an, um, a factor, it wasn't going to be one given a significant amount of weight because it would essentially result in a race to the bottom where the person who got the lease first would be the only person who could get the application license or get the license, rather. And that's not the intent of the statute. It's, the intent of the statute is to get the best possible fit for the city, not the person who first got a lease in place. Uh, the final subheader here was use of, uh, didn't, I mean, this is again, as I said, they're all kind of tied into each other, but use of unenumerated, unenumerated criteria for assessment. And this is based on their assertion that when it says you may consider the following factors, it means you may only consider these factors and none other. Again, that's not the right reading of the statute. That's not uh, a sta reading of the statute that a court would necessarily come to. <clears throat> Agencies are given uh, discretion with how they interpret their regulations if they're reasonable. And they're, they're presumed to duly act in the course of law. And if somebody wants to allege that they acted arbitrarily or capriciously, they need to prove it. In this case, making the argument that the city's utilization of additional factors, which is permitted by the statute's permissive language and by its reference to evaluation of community needs, uh, it's just not a harmonious reading of the statute. It'd be rejected by a court, in my opinion. Subheading D, deviation from a published schedule and process. Um, again, this is based on a very narrow reading of the statute, that if the city uh, did not act exactly in the manner that the appellants expected it to, that it would have violated uh, the, the rules, essentially, of the ordinance. That's not true. Um, the city's interview is not an abuse of discretion. The city conducting a panel of interviews, three of whom, uh, sorry, a panel of interviewers. Three panelists did a written review. Four panelists did an in-person review. That's a pretty reasonable and uh, not arbitrary way to go about evaluating potential applicants and licensees. The city followed uh, the requirements of the law, and I don't see any um, identification of a specific deviation in the voluminous material that was submitted to us. And the second main allegation here is just due process was violated. Uh, there's multiple elements to due process, process and substance. But again here, notice and hearing was provided. There were neutral decision makers and the city applied objective criteria. Now would all of the applicants, all of them, love to have been given every single question and every single roadmap? for how to get through that process so they could get the best possible chance at winning, of course. But they weren't given everything. They were all given a fair opportunity, and the city used criteria to apply it. 
lack of a fair hearing. Again, this comes to Embark not knowing about its own business partner's ventures and, um, and, and an allegation that the city should have informed Embark. There's no legal requirement for this. It does sort of ask a better question, which I think that uh, their counsel, a very persuasive speaker, uh, art articulated, which is we should have caught that sooner. You probably should have. You probably should have known your business partners, associations, and affiliations. And the <coughs> fact that he kept multiple irons in the fire or didn't put all his eggs in one basket means he was a little bit more savvy in that respect and he was ultimately part of a successful application team. I just don't see legal grounds for the argument that if this person's part of the team that, you know, the city has to notify everybody. That's not true. There's no factual basis for that. There's no legal basis for that. So I appreciate that they're upset and there might be some sour um, feelings left after a partnership and a business venture kind of broke down, but ultimately that's not a grounds to turn over the decision. It's not a legal basis to contest the decision. The, line, the last and final one is the false fraudulent misleading information. I heard a lot of well-spoken advocacy about how the process was uh, derailed by a, a, an individual who decided to play some subversive games. As the chief uh, testified here, or didn't, I guess he didn't take an oath, but he's generally an honest guy, has explained to you that during that process, nobody made an assertion that they owned the property, right? That they had an exclusive right to use it. In fact, they went to some lengths to disclaim that they didn't have the rights to the property. It was a model rendering presented for illustrative purposes, not as a representation of the actual business plan site or model. So with that mistaken factual assumption, uh, I don't hear or see evidence of abuse of discretion, especially one lacking in any evidentiary uh, um, support for it. In fact, I've seen the opposite. I've seen uh, a really reasonable presentation by the city staff of a two-phase interview where part of a panel conducted a written review, the other part of the panel conducted uh, an in-person interview, and they applied criteria as they were permitted to in, a, in an enabling statute that allows them some latitude to make the appropriate decisions uh, as long as they do so in a fair and even-handed manner. And I think you saw from the scoring sheets and the force ranking that it was remarkably fair and even-handed. These were conducted blind. They didn't consult as they did them. So uh, with that, I would say that would conclude our initial rebuttal. Of course, I'll remain available to answer questions after the appellant gives their uh, final rebuttal, so to speak, as part of council deliberation. There was a reply brief delivery, as you know, and I can speak to all the elements of that. Okay. Um, at this time, though, we're going to open to public comments. So those in the audience who would like to make public comments at this time, you're limited to three minutes. Uh, please come forward. I see someone starting to stand up. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and City Council members. My name is Scott Hawkins. I am on the apothecarium team and it's one, two, and a former resident of, of Santa Cruz County for 18 years. And appreciate very much the effort that's that the city staff and Chief McManus and the entire team has taken to ensure good process. Um, we submitted a response, actually Ryan Hudson, our CEO, submitted a response uh, that can be found on page 177 of the packet that addresses um, some of the issues or allegations really that, uh, that were raised in, in the appeal and also this evening. Um, importantly, uh, Mr. Swen informed us as a managing member of uh, SCBA, he had already negotiated a non-exclusive and uh, relationship with uh, Vietnam MOU uh, with another party. We didn't even know who that party was and we didn't ask. Mr. S uh, Sweat had no involvement, little involvement in our application except for um, um, <coughs> Uh, looking at a revised or reformatted resume of his. And we did not provide him with access to any materials, nor did we, of course, receive any materials from him. And according to Mr. S Sweat, he did not, he had minimal, if any, involvement with the, with the other party's application. He served merely as, in our case, as another, um, another uh, stakeholder in the capital community, one that's been dedicated to the uh, the interests of veterans throughout the county and um, could, could help um, further efforts on, upon receipt of a license if we were so awarded one. Um, also, um, the, just to follow up on the issue of the 
of the property. We uh, never assumed we had um, any connection to it, except it was potentially available. Because as we learned from, and we never spoke with the, with the owner, however, we did speak with his, his representative, who stated that the lease that was signed, I believe a week prior to the application uh, submittal deadline, was um, contingent upon um, the other parties, again, didn't know the, uh, the party's corporate name, um, contingent upon them winning a license. And we, and we used it only because it was a familiar property to um, the community, and also I believe other applicants did the same. Again, only for illustrative purposes, and to demonstrate the, how the apothecary brand would fit in the beautiful town or city of Capitola. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any others from the public would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, at this point I'd like to bring it back to Embark's rebuttal for five minutes. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and members of the council. Um, if we could go back to So with respect to the last speaker and the uh, innocent use of uh, 1850 41st Avenue, I'll just refer again to the landlord's letter. There shouldn't be any um, confusion or um, uh, misguided uh, motivations regarding who was able to use uh, and who has secured the use of that site. Uh, considerable effort went into that process of which Jason knew full well. If I understand the city attorney's uh, argument correctly, he says that we're being unreasonable because we want to rely on the code itself and that it's too narrow because the city has, in essence, and in the city attorney's opinion, um, the discretion to come up with any criteria, make any right-hand turn or left-hand turn in the process, and so there really is no reliable criteria. And we should be faulted for trying to hold the city accountable on the code. Reasonable, arbitrary, and capricious. Is it reasonable to invent a phase two? Is it reasonable to give the criteria for phase two only to people that ask for it? Is it reasonable to take field trips and have ex parte rendezvous with only the winners? Is it reasonable to ignore the scores associated with the prescribed phase one and then not utilize them at all for phase two. And if I understand the law enforcement official correctly, the way phase two came about is he called somebody and they suggested it would be a good idea. And, and so then they just went with it. And if I could show you one more slide here, these are some of the notes from the phase two interviews. Now I know tonight we saw these really nice little scorecards made, made it look like everybody agreed. Well, what we have, and, and this is a result of the public records request, are things that are unintelligible. There is no rhyme or reason except that what you notice is that the site was really important throughout this whole process, as it should be. I mean, it would. It's illogical to, to say, go open a, a cannabis dispensary if you don't even know where it's gonna be. How can you answer all the other questions associated with this process, like security and community character and the other really important aspects? And that, that's why the site was critical to this discussion. And, and what, I, what I really like here is this notion that we should be uh, faulted for having been the victims of a fraud in this process. Well, okay, let's, let's say that staff's correct in that regard. What you cannot do then as a result of that is award the, uh, the license and the permit to the bad actor. 
That would be the worst possible result of this entire process. And so all we're trying to do is give you some uh, mechanisms whereby this process can be corrected. And, and you don't you necessarily have to start over, but you do need to correct the defects. You can't simply say, oh gosh, Embark really got taken advantage of. Boy, those guys, are, they, they just fell off the back of the truck. But, you know, fair and square, that other guy got away with it, and here you go, here, you're the victor. Uh, that makes no sense whatsoever. Regarding the, uh, the claim that the, the ownership structure of Embark uh, caused the interviewees uh, to not uh, understand or appreciate uh, the ownership structure, uh, all that really needs to be said here is that 100% of the ownership of Embark participated in that interview. So it was all there. Those, those participants in the interview represented 100% of the ownership of Embark. And so what you don't have is a publicly traded Canadian conglomerate uh, representing that they're gonna serve the community of Capitola, which is what occurred in the end at the, of this process. You had 100% of the ownership structure in that interview. So it, it doesn't wash that that was a valid reason uh, to conclude that those notes somehow result in a fair uh, process that's not arbitrary and capricious. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, we open to City Council's questions of staff and the appellant. Uh, who would like to Just start? Questions or comments? These are questions of staff and appellant. No questions at this point. Um, I do have a question, though. Um, in terms of structure, did um, Chief, did everyone understand that question when that came out, and did everyone answer that question and have no issue with it, except for one? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about questions related to the ownership structure of a. Yes, I am. I, I believe with great confidence that they understood the question, yes. And how about the response of all the various applicants in the final phase? Yeah, I'm not, it, I hesitate to say that I recall all of the questions of all of the interviews for the, for the six panelists, but the questions were direct and, and I'm confident in that the question would. Okay. As one of the panelists, my recollection is, is that I, I definitely remember the top two panelists, uh, given that we're six weeks out from those interviews, answered that question very directly. Um, I know that most of the other applicants, I couldn't say if one of the other bottom ranked applicants had trouble with that question like Embark did. Okay. Hey, Mr. Mayor, if I, might, I, I might have misunderstood your question. I thought you were referring to, did all of the participants of all six finalists understood if, when we asked that question? In fact, I think you're asking about, did all the participants from Embark understand that question? Um, well, that's another question that I was going to follow up on. But my, my main issue here is that did the panelists actually, excuse me, was the question phased accurately enough so that the finalists, the six, understood what it was? And then my concern also is, did they respond? I'm trying to get an idea of how they responded to that accurately phased uh, phrase question. See if I can answer it this way. I didn't ask the question. Yes. I recall one of the gentlemen's answer to that direct question about the ownership structure is that we haven't sat down as an ownership team to discuss that yet, but we'll have that figured out before the, if we're rewarded the, the license. This is for Embark. That's for Embark, correct. Okay. Okay. Does that correspond with uh, your recollection? Yes, I believe that was either the, the first or second response to that question. Uh, I would recall that other, other firms responded with Answers like 75, 25, 75 percent. This individual, 25 percent. So there was no hesitation. It was just embark that evaded that question or did not answer it completely. Again, the the, the bottom two applicants had some trouble with other questions as well. Um, so I, I just don't remember what their specific challenges were. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly the top four, which was embark, the two that were issued, and then applicant C, um, the other three, the other three of the top four had no trouble answering that question. 
Okay. Um, any other questions here? No. Okay. I'd like to go on to uh, council deliberation and a motion. Did you want to discuss the reply brief that was delivered? Yes, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. Thanks for reminding me of that. Yes, I, uh, the information that was provided by Embark um, in that, sure. and you did have a chance to review it, so I appreciate it. Yes, jewel box went longer than expected. Okay, you took uh, advantage. I'll be brief on this because we weren't given a substantive amount of time to review it, but thankfully there's not a whole lot of new information for the council to consider contained in this document. I just want to consider it since it was brought forth. Absolutely. I, I think that's an appropriate response. I apologize. Can't bring it up. Well, I can. as we encounter. Can you read from your notes? If you can't push it up to the screen. Give me a minute. What? Give me a minute. Okay. Sorry. Why is it not? Why is it not? Mm. There we go. No, I don't. It's toggling between this and that. It's just not showing the screen. Yeah. I could use that jump drive. Oh, no, I can't. You can do it there. I just want to re just reset this. Let's switch to this TV. Hold on, hold on. No, this is it. No, no we got it. Uh, we got it over there. We got it over there. All right. So this is the letter that uh, the reply <coughs> styled, pardon me for scrolling too quickly, the reply to the city's <coughs> memorandum, which didn't come until after this council meeting had already begun this morning. Uh, as you can see, again, they're just uh, parroting some of the prior messages they had written. And, you know, I would also note that the letters that accompanied this, the two letters, one from one plant and one from Garland, two other failed applicants, are copy-paste letters that were written very clearly in a you know, at the request of what I believe to be Embark because they recite and parrot these exact same points, manner required by law, et cetera. I'll show those to you in a moment. But the selection panel did not proceed as required by law. They just repeat the, uh, the prior citations that they made that I did not find very compelling under the context of this case. Again, arguing inconsistency with the Capitola Municipal Code. Um, again, they, they reiterate this issue here, which is may consider these six factors. This is an argument that says the statute does not say the city may consider these six factors and also any other factors. If the city council intended it to say so, it would read differently. The city wants it to say it, it has to say may also consider. But you know that's just an argument we're having about statutory analysis because it does not say may only consider, which if it did would very clearly restrict the city to those six criteria, but may consider the following is viewed and interpreted permissively. So it's kind of a, re a recycle of the prior argument. Um, Again, we get down to the next paragraph here. A panel shall review the applications, considering factors important to the community, and then they bold, including those listed within subsection A5. And again, the next sentence says, um, they determine to meet, the best meet the requirements of this section bolded, and they unbold the community's needs. So you can see they're, they're picking and choosing here. They only want the six criteria evaluated. They don't want community need. They don't want uh, factors of importance to the community to be added in and considered. And I think that's because they only want one result, which is they want the license, right? But it's not a reasonable construction. Um, I thought this was an interesting citation here. Uh, they know it's not a novel legal issue. A court facing a similar question concluded that you know they applied the wrong criteria. I've looked at this case. It's a public works contracting case where the agency, a district, awarded a contract to somebody and they tried to create criteria for minority owned business good faith efforts that is strictly governed by the public contract code and state law so they were trying to override a state law with local regulation which you can't do so not exactly on point for the the point that they're trying to make going even further down here into page now three uh, Again, the first paragraph here talks about the creation of an entirely new phase and how that was totally inappropriate, an entirely new panel, which is semantics. There was a panel. Some of the members did a written interview. Some of the members did an in-person interview. You could call those two panels, but it's really just a matter of semantics. The city manager uh, you know, put together a panel constituted of no less than, more than, three non-conflicted individuals who applied neutral criteria, so I don't see any validity to that. Um, again. The second paragraph sort of parrots the first. 
This is a new argument here, and it's in addition, this section of the CMC limits the uh, code for one person, one license. I would note for you that this is a new argument raised on appeal. Basic rules of, of court and fundamental fairness. Don't let people sandbag their arguments till the very end and introduce new arguments for the first time, especially at an 11th hour submittal. But I would note that what this actually says is that a person can only hold one license, right? It doesn't say that you can't apply for multiple licenses. They're arguing that because it says you can only en end up having one license per owner or operator, that no uh, Mr. Sweat's participation was a violation of the ordinance. It would be a violation of the ordinance if he held, or if a proprietor or an owner held multiple, possibly, but that didn't result here, and so it's not a violation of the ordinance. It would be convenient for the uh, appellant if that were the case, but it does not say you can only apply for one. It says that you may only hold one, meaning that if you win, maybe you have to make a choice about which application or which group you proceed with. Uh, again, this final section here about the statute man mandating a selection process by a panel, that's again, that's semantics about panel, panels, you know, no less than three, no more than three. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, the publication of rules, regulations, and standards enacted by the chief, this is their argument that the city needed to promulgate mu much more than it did. And the section of the code that they're talking about, A12, allows the, the it's called a, um, the city council by creating that ordinance in that way which allows the chief of police the city manager or designee to promulgate binding rules and regulations is done so you don't have to come back and amend your ordinance every time it's appropriate for the city to do that so that it doesn't have to constantly amend its ordinance and what it talks about is the chief of police's ability to you know if he wants to make a regulation because we have a new problem we can address it and specifically subsection a 12 d talks about promulgating advertising regulations and the city is now the, being shifted that we had a duty to disclose that to Embark. Um, on the information about the site, um, as it was brought out, um, both on the website, it says that no site plan is necessary at this stage. On the application, it states that no site plan is necessary. Um, and we've heard the evidence saying that actually there was no misleading information presented at any of the interviews. Um, and since the site plan is not necessary uh, for that stage of the application process, um, if at, you know, at the most it was just harmless error, um, if there was any error at all that occurred in that situation, because it wasn't a relevant factor. Um, and I just wanted to set for the record, those are my reasons why I'm gonna support the motion. Thank you. Just for the record that um, Capital does often, from my experience and my 12 years of being on this bench, one way or the other, um, follow a similar process of winnowing down the um, large field of applicants in many cases and trying to come up with a representative sample of what we think are the best. Embark was part of that group. And then we go to a final, uh, more detailed or more um, involved process. And um, just as Ed said, we did that recently um, in another hire and there's many other hiring processes. I haven't been involved with, but um, this recent one, we spent quite a bit of time trying to narrow down uh, a wide, uh, excuse me, a wide um, application pool to those we thought uh, would be uh, reasonable for us to consider. And then we focused on those that we felt were very reasonable applicants and ones we would like to have potentially um, working for the city of Capitola this is not an uncommon practice. It's one that's well accepted on private and in public uses of public and private time to try to figure out who is the best. And I think we did that. I think the process was a good one. In terms of um, not answering questions that are given to applicants and being evasive or indicating that 
in some way or another that they're going to evade that question is concerning to me. And I, I could see why that um, was a problem for the panelists and definitely affected the outcome of the final phase. So those are two reasons that I'd like to um, put out there why I'm going to vote for this. Um, see, sir, could, can we have a roll, roll call, call vote on this, please? Thanks. And it is a motion to uphold the staff, staff recommendation. Correct. Council member Story. Um, and to deny the appeal? That's yes. what. Okay. Uh, aye. Council member Peterson. Aye. Council member Brooks. Aye. Council member Bottorf. Aye. Mayor Bertrand. Aye. So it passes. Upheld unanimously. We're going to take a brief break here. <laughs> it's been a long day. Uh, I know. Control second session. Call second session. So we're on to item E. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would recommend that we take the full consent item this evening uh, at this point. 8F. Yeah, 8F. Oh, right. I'm sorry, Nikki. Yeah. Again, and Larry, yes. Okay. So um, could you remind me? I'm so section E. Um, Item E. 
It's item E? Eight, well, eight F. 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 We have not a brief staff report prepared for it. Yeah. Okay, item F, that's right. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. I just want to give a quick uh, overview of what the uh, leader and coordinator positions for the after school program, came about, how it came about. Um, the leader and coordinator positions are were structured 5% above both the camp capital leaders and uh, um, coordinators. The proposed leader starts at fourteen fifty nine an hour. Currently, the minimum wage in California is $12 an hour. It'll go up on the 1st of uh, January to uh, $13 an hour, and by 2022, January 1st, it'll be at $15 an hour. Every year, we do do adjustments to include those um, changes to minimum wage, but we also include um, changes to the other positions to make sure there's not compaction. So if we, we, have, we raise the, the entry level position by a dollar, we also go out with the other positions to make sure that they're not too close. So that's kind of, I just want to give you kind of the background on how we handle the part-time seasonal positions. So with that clarification, do you have any more questions? Ed? Question. So we currently are within state guidelines with our with our salaries. Oh uh, yes, yes, sir. Okay. Okay. I um, I would just like to add some points of reference of where this came from, so I can give if this is appropriate time. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, so we are in pilot mode for this after school program, and as I've seen, and I sit on the Child Care Planning Council, I've received numerous reports on providing quality education and sustainability is so important for students. And one of the things we need to do is always think about it at the ground level of how much we pay staff. It's a huge issue. A new report will actually be released next week about the um, insufficient pay scale on how we pay folks. Be it this is a new program and a pilot program, I think it's important that we create the foundation correctly from the get-go not to revisit it in 2020 when we finally get there because the state has realized you know minimum wage should be 15 dollars an hour i think this is a great opportunity for us to set the bar where it should be from the, at the forefront by doing so i really do believe that we will get quality staff hired and staff who will stick around um, and that's really important when we when we work with with kiddos is that we that they have somebody there every day that they are there and familiar with them not a big turnaround on like a seasonal person where these part-time seasonal positions where we see on the beach they're part-time they're student workers or they're high school students who come and go this after school leader and coordinator will be in these kids lives for multiple years all day monday through friday several hours a day so I think that's the big difference when we're looking at this pay scale. On top of it, since we already know that in 2020 it's going to happen, my whole point is why not do it now? It's a 40 cents difference to start out. It's not huge, but it's, go ahead, do you want to say something? Um, that I recognize that in January it'll change a little bit, but again, it's starting now at 15, and then sure, in January they get another bump or whatever. But I, I really just want to advocate for the people who are not even hired yet so that we create a program that is, is well-rounded, sustainable, that is identifying and recognizing all the issues we see in all sorts of other programs, preschool programs, after-school programs. This is really setting the bar. And since we're breaking ground already with one of the very new after-school pilot programs in the state, we should do it right. I'm confused here because I thought you said that it's thirteen dollars and twenty, fourteen dollars and twenty-one, and fifteen dollars and twenty-two. Is that what the state's mandating? Did I? That that's correct. Okay, so they're not going to give give fifteen dollars an hour until twenty-two, and we're right now at fourteen fifty nine. We're going to go to I, well, this by twenty twenty-two. We're going to be above what the state's going to be mandating. Yeah, am, I, yeah. am I reading so, that right? So uh, so. Let me try to frame the context here. So this is our hourly schedule. So you'll see the bottom of the hourly schedule for these hourly employees is the junior guard, the assistant junior guard instructors. So that's the one that over time next year, for example, when minimum wage goes up to $13 an hour, that'll have to go up. 
And when that one position that I have highlighted there goes up, there's this cascading domino effect and all the other positions move up along with it. So, and we do that every year as the minimum wage has been stepping up. And so I think Councilwoman Brooks is suggesting, let's start this one at 15 um, because we know that that's where the minimum wage is gonna ultimately be. And rather than setting it 1459 today, said it started at 15 today. Okay. I, I, well, that was not a question. Are we into discussion or are we already, I had questions. I was just want a clarification. A scheme to this, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I see the point. I, and I don't know how else to finagle the fact that that we should be paying after school leaders from the get-go what a minimum wage starting salary would be in 2020 we right. should start it now since the so we're not in the discussion I, I i was asking a question i don't know if we're going to go through the process and ask the public then come back and have a discussion i'd rather go through that process mm -hmm. unless okay. somebody else has a question. no more questions okay um there's no one from the public here to comment but I'll give that opportunity. <laughs> okay, seeing none. Um, I would like to ask Nikki if you would come forward and give us an idea of what you feel uh, the after school leader would be doing and in, in your um, concept of what an appropriate wage is to start. And I also know there's some steps here. So um, the zero step is that sort of like an inexperienced person. You want to get them on board, you want to train them, and then you jump them up to the next step after they've qualified and now they're at 15. So just give me an idea of how you would imagine uh, dealing with this new staff person. Okay. Um, so first of all, the I, when we were talking about deciding on the salary of these individuals, I, I did intentionally want the salary to be higher than the summer seasonal workers in order to address that exact issue that they are having a much more longer term contact with the youth and to have that stability um i agree is very important in the in these kind of staff because they provide that out of school time impact in a pretty positive way um and then with the starting at zero so if a staff member that has that they interview well and they are able to um, I mean that they have like all of the basics right so that they would start at zero and then the city um, practice policy is that after a six month probationary period they would be considered for an additional step increased based on um, right I'm quoting that right uh, based on their performance in that probationary period. So after six months, it's already built in that they would potentially be moving up a step. Um, additionally, in this structure, the six months would be hitting about the same time that the minimum wage would be increasing and the automatic s increase that is built in would happen at that same time. So this is built into the system and this uh, step is at your discretion being the manager? That's true, yeah. I, if there was an individual that, for example, came in and they had a master's degree, but they were really passionate about after-school programs and that's kind of what they wanted to do, um, then I would consider perhaps a higher step because of their higher level of experience. Okay, so you're recognizing Yvette's comments that we want qualified staff and you're telling me that you want to have them paid accordingly to their qualifications and if they're new or young and have no experience you start them off and then do the evaluary mm -hmm. evaluation period okay any other questions of Nikki the director does this sort of go in the direction you're thinking it actually makes more sense to me now seeing this that after six months they would be receiving actually even more than the minimum wage that would take effect in 2020 and granted the pilot program will be happening in the 1920 fiscal year mm -hmm. it all makes perfect sense with that if anyone else was entertained as excited as I am to offer more money for these folks and continue on I mean I can, we can still call the vote um, but I appreciate that information thank you thank you um, I appreciate that Nikki you've thought through this and um, yeah. 
I, I, I do. I, it, there's, it's well structured uh, from my perspective at this point. Any other questions of Nikki? And thank you for bringing that question up. I appreciate it. It got us focused on something that's important. And the reason why it's important is she wants this program to be successful. And I know she's worked with you on this. So I think it was a well-placed question. Thank you. So um, is there a motion? I have a comment. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Ed? Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, here's the thing. You know, I think it's a great program. I supported this program that came online. When it comes to arbitrarily giving someone an increase, that puts me at a disposition because I value every one of our employees and everybody that does anything. And to do something that so goes out of a sink for a reason, I can't justify that. I have I problem with that. Uh, so that, that's the reason why I hesitated on this. I think this is fair. I think it's great. It's going to correct itself. But I don't want anybody else to feel like we just all of a sudden pick on somebody and say they're entitled to a bonus for some reason. So I'm happy with uh, make a motion to adopt the schedule uh, uh, as is. Second. Second. Okay. Um, I'll make one last comment. Uh, the reason why I asked Nikki to talk was because I did not think this was arbitrary. I wanted to know what the rationale was behind it, and I've noticed that in her planning, and so I wanted to hear um, her, her voice on that. So, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No, it passes. Thank you. So let's go on to item E, public banking legislation. M Mr. Mayor, members of the council, this item is on the agenda of the request of council member Story. It's to Councilmember Story asked for a briefing about public banking options that were being considered in the state legislature. Uh, I did a bit of research and there's two bills that are out there right now, Assembly Bill 857 and Senate Bill 528. Um, and the item today would be to consider sending a letter of support to the bill's authors and our legislative delegation uh, in support of either one of these pieces of legislation. Just very quickly a bit about public banking. Public banking is essentially exactly what it sounds like. It is a institution that functions like a private bank but is a public entity. A common example that's cited by advocates of public banks is the North Bank of North Dakota, which has been operating, I believe, for um, almost 100 years, maybe more than 100 years. Um, and it's allowed the state of North Dakota to save money on banking fees that would otherwise be going to large financial institutions. And I think according to the Bank of North Dakota's most recent statements, they've returned more than a billion dollars to the state, I guess, over the... Um, over the 100 year history. So it is substantial amounts of money that can add up. Now, the two bits of legislation that are out there, um, Assembly Bill 857, I believe you got a uh, letter suggesting that we should support it. The city of Santa Cruz and the county has supported it along with a few other jurisdictions around the state. Uh, I will be honest with you, I think Assembly Bill 857, it, it would empower cities to start their own public bank or joint powers authorities or partnerships between counties and cities. Um, usually I'm all for more opportunities, more tools in the toolkits for cities. I'll be honest with you though, it, it makes me a little bit nervous just from my professional experience that I don't know that we would really want to have a whole bunch of public banks and I don't know that that necessarily falls in the wheelhouse of every city um, and that every city would necessarily do it really well and if they didn't, the backlash on cities that really weren't involved would probably be harsh. We've seen that before when cities kind of fall off the bus. Sometimes the ensuing legislation constrains everyone else that was doing things well. Alternatively, Senate Bill 8528 seems to me pretty logical. It, it would empower the state's iBank, which is an institution that we've worked with in the past, state agency that borrows a whole bunch of money at really low rates and then will dole it out to cities for smaller loans. Um, it would empower them to be a depository institution. So you could take your money and deposit it with them and they could serve as your bank. So kind of replicating the Bank of North Dakota, but not letting every city set it up. Sort of keeping the expertise housed maybe more within the state of California. That bill, that Senate bill has been tabled, so it's not gonna come up again this legislative session. Um, but intuitively to me, I think that 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 may be ultimately a better potential direction. Alternatively, we could simply monitor this and provide other reports down the road if there's any changes in public banking legislation. So I think your options tonight are to direct uh, the mayor, we would pro provide a letter for him to either write a letter in support of either one of these bills. Alternatively, we could just continue to monitor this and provide updates as they're available. Thank you for your attention. Any comments from city council members? Comments? Questions? Questions. 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 Oh, sorry. 
I have no question. Addle brain. <laughs> okay, any questions of city staff on this? Okay, any questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, bringing it back to city council for comments and motion. Yeah, let me just try to make a motion that we uh, authorize the mayor to send a letter uh, in support of uh, Assembly Bill 857 and Senate Bill 528. Um, I think it's good for liquidity and uh, making more funds available um, uh, in the community for businesses and nonprofits and also under the Senate Bill f um, for local governments. Um, so I don't, and I don't think that necessarily means that we would do that. Um, it may not be appropriate for the city of Capitola, um, but I think it overall helps the economy uh, in our state. And for that reason, I would encourage us to, if nothing else, send a letter in support. Thank you. Second. I'll second that motion. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Nope. It carries. Thank you very much. Hey, we put in a long day. We Whoa. did. <laughs> it's only been 12 hours. What are you hey, 14. I was going to say it's been 14. Is it overtime or something? No overtime. How about another meal? Is it, is it, is it, is it, is it a third meal? <laughs>